All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is August 24th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. The call-in number is 669-900-6833. The collaboration code is 814-8152-8029. Again, this information is posted on the Planning Department webpage. If you forgot the phone number or the uh, web link, it is there. All right, a little more information about how the meeting will go. During key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your phone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that asks you to unmute. Please accept the pop-up and state your name for the record and provide your testimony. If you're calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. And I will remind folks of these instructions as we move into the public hearing. If at any time you're having difficulty connecting to the meeting today, um, we do have support staff with us, Michael Lamb. You can email him anytime and he will um, let me know to pause the meeting um, so that we can make sure you can, that you're connected. Um, his email is michael.lam, L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. So he'll be checking his email periodically today and he's on standby and ready to assist. All right, so those are the instructions. Here's where we're situated. I see our commissioners are with us today. I'll turn the meeting over to Chair Tim Gordon. Good morning. Good morning, Jocelyn. How are you? Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public and everyone else listening. Today is August the 10th, and we're gonna start our planning commission hearing. It is now 9.33 and we can call this meeting to order. Um, Wanted to start with a roll call, if we could, please, Ms. Drake. All right. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Renee? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Violante? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here, thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, quick housekeeping item, just wanted to put out there early on that we're going to take a 30 minute lunch break at 1130 today. So wherever we are in the agenda, we're just gonna take a quick pause right when we get to 1130 um, and take a lunch break. Um, that being said, we can move on to additions and corrections to the agenda. Do we have any today, Ms. Drake? Um, yeah, this is uh, posted on the um, agenda um, on the website, but I just wanted to remind everybody that um, that might be listening today that um, the um, item number six has been um, removed from the agenda today. That um, is the appeal of 22702 East Cliff Drive. That project um, will be uh, re-noticed um, in the future when we return to the Planning Commission with that item, probably in October, it's looking like. Um, and then I have another correction actually to the agenda, which is to item number seven, the growth goal item. Um, <clears throat> that um, correction is um, that on the posted agenda and the advertised agenda, the um, description for that item was incorrectly 
um, incorrectly reflects a recommended growth goal of um, 0.25 percent, that number should be corrected to 0.5 percent. And um, so I wanted to make that correction to that agenda item. And I think policy staff will reiterate that in their presentation as well. And there are no further corrections. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any members of the commission that would like to declare any ex parte communications today? Okay, Commissioner Lazenby. Uh, no, I have no. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, great. Hearing none, we can move on to agenda item number four, oral communications. This is the time when members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. Um, Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak at this time? Um, yes, and if we could get two minutes on the timer for these comments. Um, I see that we have one hand raised. Phone number, la, digits 2915. Good morning, please state your name for the record. You have two minutes. And you need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone possibly. Caller with the last four digits, 2915, if you wish to make a comment, um, please unmute yourself. You have two minutes. I'm not seeing. Um, I see another hand raised, so maybe we'll go to that person. First, I see a hand raised by a gentleman named Oliver. Um, good morning, Oliver. Please state your full name for the record. You have two minutes. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Hello, please state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Oliver Carter. Good morning. And good morning. Um, I'm just speaking in um, uh, concern about a rezoning of 3051 and 3055 Portola Drive. Um, my wife and I are, are the current owners of Blown Out Wetsuit Repair and Surf Shack uh, located in the historical landmark at 3055 Portola Drive. Uh, this 98 year old building uh, has a very local a rich local history, and it's the site where Freeline Surf Shop began in 1969. Uh, before that, Doug Hout had his surf shop here, and uh, it is also my knowledge that currently th this historic building um, is being considered for rezoning. Oliver, uh, if, I, if I could interrupt a quick second, I apologize, and we can add sure. some time back to this. If this is in regards to the sustainability update, yes, that okay, so that public comment period has not started yet. This oh. part is for uh, any that's okay. Any Anything communication else? that's not on the agenda. Yep. So um, I appreciate that. It, yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, I, will, I will wait. <laughs> Sounds good. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I... All right. Um, so I'll go back to the first caller. Um, with the last four digits, 2915. Um, good morning. If you would like to make a comment on Anything not on the agenda today, please state your name for the record. You have two Hello. minutes. He Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good morning. Excellent. Thank you. I was pressing star six madly many times and it just oh, uh, didn't work. So um, this time the announcement came on that the host would like me to unmute myself. So um, thank you for um, connecting that ability for me. Sorry about Good that. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos, and um, I have a couple of comments. One is that um, I had some difficulty in finding the access information for today's meeting. It is not on your agenda, and I would like to ask that it be put on your agenda. Sorry. 
uh, agenda masthead, I had to go to the planning department's home page and scroll down and find it there. So um, I request that for future um, better public access and more expedient that all connection information, including uh, the code star nine to raise your hand. That's not there, but I, you know, we've all gotten used to this, so I start trying that, and it worked to raise my hand. But it's not anywhere in the planning commission's um, or planning department's notification. So that's my my first request. Uh, the second request has to do with the um, upcoming water issues in our county and um, I, I do note that that is still a big issue in the, the county's growth goal but apart from all of that I want to let you know that there are major restrictions in um, water permitting coming down the pike um, Governor Newsom issued an executive order N-7-22 that will require any new wells and possibly um, repairs of existing wells to be reviewed, uh, first of all, by a, a geohydrologist that will authorize and, and put their name on a, a statement that the, the well will not affect neighboring wells. That's going to be hard to get somebody to do. And then second of all, those permits have to be reviewed by the appropriate uh, groundwater agency group. So um, the County Environmental Health Water Resources Department is has developed a form and a rudimentary process, but this is a big deal. The other thing I want to let you know is that yesterday- Becky, I might interrupt. I, we appreciate the comment. We're uh, over time. And so um, we, we, we appreciate your feedback and input and thank you so much. Okay. Okay, are, are all comments today going to be reduced to two minutes? Um, no, it's, it's two minutes for, for a general comment, three minutes for comments um, under the public hearing items. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, seeing. Let me check and see. It looks like we have a hand raised. And I'm having a hard time seeing that one. Um, uh, let's see. Bear with me for a second. It's, it appears we have a hand raised, but I'm not able to locate it here. Um, if support staff, I'm seeing a hand raised, but I'm not able to see the hand, the person whose hand is up. I'm not sure why that is. Oh, it went down and it went back up again. Um, Jocelyn, I see Mando Morlos has a hand raised. Can you see that? Thank you for that. I, if you scroll I, all the way up on the attendees. I am not seeing that person. <laughs> um, but let thank you for that. I, let's call on... Um, Nando, did you say it was Nando Mores? Okay. Ma Mando Morlos. Mando Morlos. Okay. Um, good morning, Mar uh, Mando. Will you please restate your name for the record? And you have. Good morning, everybody. This is Mando. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll do this Sorry quick here. 
Um, if I understand correctly, this is uh, the meeting about the general plan. Um, yes, but the public uh, comment period for um, the, the sustainability update will be later in the meeting. This is for this is the time for folks to provide comment on anything not on the agenda. OK, so this is a, a once in a generation opportunity for us to try to make our community better. And I just found out about this meeting yesterday. Um, so as important as this is with housing and transportation, <laughs> agriculture, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, code modernization. I'm, ho I'm hoping that you guys um, can get together with the local media, the Sentinel, the Paroni, and such, so that you can make an announcement so that those of us in the public can have more time to prepare for this so we can uh, give you guys some better feedback. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Justin, could I comment? Sure. Um, let's uh, I just wanted to say that this will go before the our meetings. Uh, we have one more meeting on this and then we'll be through, but it is going to all go to the board. So everything's online and you can view it there, but you can also appear at the hearings next time and in front of the board. So there still is time for your input and comments. All right, thank you, Renee. Um, do we have any additional members of the public who wish to provide, provide comment at this time? I see a hand being raised. Oh. And Hi, my name is Andrew. Uh, good morning, Andrew. Please state your name for the record. Oh, uh, yeah, Andrew Paolini. I live in Boulder Creek. Um, I just want to raise my hand. Uh, just building off what the last um, commenter said, um, in terms of making these meetings more available to the public, I understand that making it online is intended to make it more available, but I think the times, because I understand it like um, the planning commission, you know, they don't, they have like a work from like nine to five, right? But um, so, but like having it 930, I think that tends to limit who can participate in these meetings. A lot of people who may be young people, who are working or students or in general people who had just 9 30 a.m on a weekday is often i think it, it restricts the people who can participate to mostly say retired people or others who can afford to take time off and that's one thing i'd i'd note about like making this more accessible to the public at large um since in, in general i think one of the issues with a lot of these kind of a public meetings to get public input is that it's not really the public it's just whoever what part of small fraction of public that has the time um and energy to devote to like attending one of these meetings since they're not often located at the best times for most people that's all i had to say okay thank you okay and are there any other members of the public who wish to provide general comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand by pressing star nine or using the hand icon on the, um, the Zoom app. Okay. I am not seeing any at this time, so I will turn it back over to you, Chair. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who spoke. And we do really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here with us and to provide us feedback. So thank you so much. Uh, we understand that it's not always easy. Um, that said, we can close oral communications at this time, and move on to the next scheduled item, which is the approval of minutes of the August 10th, 2022 planning commission hearing. Um, would any members of the commission like to make a motion on this? Commissioner Lazenby, I will move to adopt or approve. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. I will second that. And a second from Commissioner Dan. Thank you so much. All of those in favor of this, please uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstaining? 
great with that. The motion passes and we can move on to our next agenda item as stated previously by Ms. Drake, agenda item number six has been removed and is going to be re-noticed. And so we are going to move on to agenda item number seven today, public hearing on recommendation to the Board of Supervisors regarding the proposed year 2023 growth goal. Ms. Drake, do we have staff and a presentation for this item? Uh, we do, I believe. Natisha Williams is with us this morning and will be presenting this item. Yes, good morning, commissioners. Let me share my screen for the presentation. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Great, okay. Uh, so good morning, commissioners. My name is Natisha Williams. I'm a senior planner for the Community Development and Infrastructure Department. And today I'm here to talk about the year 2023 growth goal. The county's growth management system was instituted in 1979 following the adoption of Measure J to address the resource and public services impacts of population growth in Santa Cruz County. As part of the growth management system, each year the county is required to set an annual growth goal for the upcoming year that it represents a fair share of the state's growth. The 2023 growth goal report is before you today for consideration. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to kind of reiterate what Jocelyn had mentioned um, to note that there was an error in the published agenda for this item. The agenda incorrectly stated that a 0.25% proposed growth goal um, for the year 2023 when in fact it is um, we're proposing a 0.5% growth goal, and we'll discuss this in more detail later in the presentation. Okay, so this uh, growth goal report examines various factors used in establishing the year 2023 growth goal for the unincorporated area, including analysis of population growth trends, resource constraints, the status of this year's allocation, the county's housing needs, including progress towards meeting the county's required RENA or regional housing needs allocation. Um, it also includes a review of demolition permits and density bonus projects approved in the past year, as well as an ADU annual report. And this year's report also includes a discussion on the pipeline of current subsidized affordable housing projects, um, as well as the continued impacts of recent state law on the county's growth management system. So as the growth goal report notes, the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County had an estimated negative 3.2% growth rate last year. Um, and all jurisdictions in the county, um, except for the city of Santa Cruz, also saw around a negative, um, around a 3% 3, uh, 3 negative population decline, uh, which is a stark contrast to the year before when populations were up about 1% everywhere in the county, except for the city of Santa Cruz, which saw a population decrease of about 11%. And these uh, big population shifts in recent years are really closely tied to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the stay-at-home orders, particularly in regards to the student population to, um, at UC Santa Cruz. The county as a whole has seen declining population totals in recent years with a 0%, 0, uh, 0 growth in 2021. And the state population actually decreased um, for the second year in a row by 0.3% uh, in 2021. Population estimates for cities and unincorporated counties are determined using um, the housing unit method uh, by the Department of Finance, which means that the number of new units constructed each year plays a really large role in determining the annual population estimates. The DOF um, also notes that the state's un unprecedented negative growth uh, rate in the last couple of years is the result of a few major factors, including continuing declines in natural increase as baby boomers age um, and natural increase meaning births minus deaths, um, as well as continuing declines in foreign immigration that have been accelerated by recent federal policy and delays in, in the process as well as the continued um, increased number of deaths associated, associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in addition, there's been an, uh, a decrease in domestic or increase in domestic out migration. Um, so while population has steadily grown in the state of California and county as a whole, 
Since the mid 20th century, population growth in the unincorporated area has had a slightly different trajectory. As shown in figure A, the unincorporated area's population grew rapidly in the 1960s and 70s, surpassing growth rates in the state and the county as a whole. Um, but growth rates declined in the following decades and population actually decreased in our area between the 2000 and 2010 census year. Uh, but despite these recent um, you know, declines that we just talked about from the year-to-year -year population estimates reported by the DOF, the 2020 census data actually shows that overall the unincorporated uh, county population is actually on the rise with an average annual uh, growth of 0.2% over the last decade and a total increase of about 2,400 people since 2010. The growth goal also summarizes the current status for the 2022 residential building permit allocations. And this year, um, 26 allocations have been granted as of July 1st. And if demand continues at the current rate, 52 allocations will be granted by the end of the year. And this is uh, higher than last year when we saw only 21 building permit allocations granted as of July 1st, 2021. Um, despite the slight increase, demand for allocations has remained low compared to previous decades and staff anticipates there will be more than enough permits available for the remainder of this year. And um, although allocations remain low this year, um, there are a number of major projects currently in construction in the county, including three density bonus projects, um, the Habitat, Habitat for Humanity project on Harper Street, the Mid Penn Housing project on Capitola Road, and the SoCal Townhomes project. Um, there's also a 100% affordable residential housing project in South County, known as Pippin Orchards 2, which is in the construction phase. And all of these projects are reflected on um, table 10 of the report, which shows that 219 housing units were issued building permits as of July 1st of this year, including 125 affordable units. And this pipeline of county projects also includes applications for three new density bonus project applications submitted uh, as of July 1st of this year and three um, density projects currently in preliminary review. In accordance with the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, um, Senate Bill 330, which was updated with Senate Bill 8, uh, Santa Cruz County will continue to not enforce the Measure J, uh, Measure J growth goal limit on residential allocations within affected county areas while the statute is, statute is in place, um, which will be until January 1st, uh, 2030. In Santa Cruz County, this includes the following CDPs. Live Oak, Paso Tiempo, Paradise Park, and Amesti, as shown in blue on the map uh, on this slide. All other aspects of Measure J unrelated to limiting building permits and populations, such as the county has affordable housing requirements, are not impacted by SB 330 or SB 8, and staff will continue to track Measure J allocations in the growth goal report and subsequent building permit issuance for reporting purposes. In addition, pursuant to Santa Cruz County Code, um, all residential units impacted by the CZU August Lightning Complex fire will continue to be exempt from the Measure J residential permit allocation system. So based on this analysis um, included in the report in more detail, staff recommends that the growth goal be set at 0.5% for calendar year 2023. In past years, the county's growth goal has been consistent with the, state's, uh, the state of California's growth rate. Um, constituting our fair share of population growth as dictated by Measure J. But as we noted earlier, um, there were a number of anomalies in the state's growth rate that contributed to population decline. And moreover, census data indicates the population in the county has actually grown over the past decade. And AMBAG projections um, show that this steady increase is likely to continue. In addition, the number of housing projects currently in the county's permitting pipeline, as well as the elevated permit activity seen in recent years, point to a potential increased demand for market rate permits that may continue through next year. And it's also important to consider that state legislation continues to refine state housing and ADU laws and pass, uh, pass additional bills aimed at streamlining housing permits and increasing infill development, such as Senate Bill 9, which will allow up to four units to be built on an existing single family lots. In light of all of this, staff is recommending a 0.5% growth rate for calendar year 2023. 
This growth rate would result in an allocation of 256 market rate units available for the year 2023. And allocations would be distributed in the between the urban and rural areas uh, at a 75 to 25% ratio in order to recognize the greater potential for infill development in urban areas. The 2023 growth goal report also recommends as in previous years that the unused market rate allocations from 2022 be carried over to 2023 in accordance with policy 3.2 of the general plan housing element. So this would was result in a projected total of 334 market rate residential building permit allocations available for 2023. And staff has found that establishment of the uh, 2023 growth goal is exempt under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and a notice of exemption has been prepared. And so with that, staff uh, therefore recommends that the Planning Commission one, conduct a public hearing on the proposed year 2023 growth goal, uh, adopt the attached resolution, Exhibit A, recommending a year 2023 growth goal of 0.5% for the unincorporated portion of Santa Cruz County, and three, recommend the filing of the CEQA notice of exemption, Exhibit B, with the, uh, the clerk of the board. This concludes the presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams. We really appreciate that. Um, it's always so much, so helpful to hear it said and um, get some clarification uh, along the way. So uh, right now I'll just bring it back to the commission and see if anyone had any questions they'd like to follow up with uh, on this topic. Is there any chance we could stop sharing the screen also so I can see all the, of the commission again? Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. um, if no one had any questions, I had a few. And this is just something that I know, you know we see, but uh, like I saw last year, I just still want to make sure I get it all right in my head here. So um, just to be really clear, this this growth goal, the units that are allowed are allocated for building permits next year, 334 units. That does not include areas in the affected zones by SB 330 and SB 8, and it does not include affordable housing. Is that correct? So um, you're right that it does not include affordable units. It also does not include um, accessory dwelling units. Um, but we are counting areas in those, um, you know, those, those blue county affected CDPs. Um, we are adding those to the allocation. They're just for reporting purposes. We wouldn't enforce that if they somehow reached the limit. That's how we're kind of treating that to make sure we're consistent with state law. Got it. Okay. So, so then how is that allocated? Like, is there a percentage in the affected areas and the percentage that's not, or is it just like? No, it's only divided between the urban area and the rural area. Um, most of the affected areas in the urban area, I think there might be some, uh, like Casa Tampo might be just outside of the urban services line. Um, but so we just we just track it and and identify what CDP it's in and, and mm -hmm. ensure that it's um, not being, in, that the growth goal is not being, uh, treated as a limit in those specific areas. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so then just as this relates to RENA cycle, which is obviously a big deal these days, um, and a lot of units that we need to permit, you know, with, like you said, things getting faster with permitting process, um, you know, from state bills and things like that. Um, I guess my question is if we actually met our RENA numbers, we, we couldn't actually build them based on this, is that correct? Or could we, is there a way around that? So um, our, our RENA numbers for the rest of this cycle, um, let me get the exact number. I believe it's it's less than the recommended um, growth goal for this year. So okay. um, we're just looking at market rate uh, permits, um, just as a reminder. So if you look at the market rate permits that we have for the remainder of the cycle, um, it looks like we are, uh, so there's a total of 570 that remain for this RENA cycle, including 266 market rate units. So this growth goal allows for us to meet it within the next year. Um, and, it would, you know, 
Yeah. So okay, that makes sense. The limit. And then on the next cycle, will the arena numbers because they're going to go up substantially? And correct me, is the is the next cycle start after next year? I believe it starts after 2023. Um, but I, I think I'll hand it off to Stephanie um, to talk a little bit more about the upcoming arena cycle. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. Hi. Good morning. Uh, Stephanie Hansen, assistant director in CDI. Um, uh, the, the the thing that we don't want the growth goal to do is is limit unnecessarily limit growth, um, and so staff monitors the numbers as we go along the way, especially as we get toward the end of the year. If we think that um, boy, we might be actually for the first time since like the seventies or nineties build builds build more than than we had predicted. Um, and in that case, uh, there is an option for uh, staff to return to the board to ask them to in increase the number of units. Um, so <clears throat> with the changes um, going into place um, with the state law initiatives and maybe not next year, but the year after with some of the sustainability update changes we're making, we're hoping to see those numbers increase and the growth goal would logically um, be higher to, to accommodate to accommodate that, if that, if that makes sense. We, yeah. it, we don't necessarily look at the arena and go, okay, we need like 800 units every year and then set the growth goal that, that way because mm, we're not, we're not convinced that a lot of jurisdictions are going to be able to meet those arenas. You know, the numbers are extreme. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that makes sense. And so I appreciate that. That cleared it up for me. Um, I didn't have any other questions. So I'm not sure if anyone else did or uh, we can move on to public comment if no one else had any further questions. Okay. Sounds good. Well, uh, then at this time, we can move on to the public comment portion of this agenda item. Ms. Drake, are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this item? It looks like so. Um, if we could get three minutes on the timer, that would be great. And I am seeing a hand raised again by caller 2915. Um, so good morning. If you could please state your name for the record, that would be wonderful. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Becky. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, I'm interested in why, with reducing, with declining county population, the recommendation has been to increase from previous uh, recent years a growth goal of point uh, zero point two five percent to now 0.5%. Um, it's not really consistent with the existing trends that we are seeing. And with the economy and housing prices, I don't expect that to really uh, change. So I'd like some discussion about the um, justification for increasing county's growth goal. I also um, wanna ask about uh, uh, some information I'm seeing, Table 8 on page 24, um, the Measure J residential allocation status. Can you talk about that? Um, what, where are the Measure J units going to be? I understand that process and that they are deed restricted. So um, if you can please let us know if any of these affordable units that have been um, supposedly allocated if those are going to be Measure J deed restricted units. I also have a question on page 23 about um, table five, allocation status of approved major projects. The Aptos Village project has a, a total market number of 59. There are a total of 69 units there, 10 of which are Measure J units. But I don't understand the units from previous allocations, 49, and that there are 10 remaining allocations 
um, for that project. That doesn't make sense to me, and I would ask that you explain that. Um, I wanted to let you know that the CZU fire rebuilds are going to face a new hurdle because of action the County Board of Supervisors took yesterday regarding the um, uh, new septic system regulations. It's, got, it's called the LAMP, and it will, in effect, restrict building and rebuilding in many of the rural areas of our county due to septic constraints that have just been passed as of yesterday. It will require people to put in very expensive um, alternative treatment systems that cost upward of $80,000. And all supervisors yesterday acknowledged this will harm the CZU fire people as they try to rebuild. I also want to um, point out that um, your, once again, your, your water issue is here in the growth gold. And um, in exhibit A, number seven, it, um, it, it, it talks about the safe yield of the basin. That has not been established yet. So I would like a, a scientific reference to what the safe yield is in the growth goal, um, because it, to my understanding, has Becky. not been established for the basin. Right. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, we appreciate Becky. it. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. All right. All right. Um, I am seeing a hand raised by Andrew Paulini. Um, good morning. Please uh, restate your name for the record. Oh, uh, Andrew Paulini. Oh, uh, my comment in, um, about was kind of in response to the last comment about why the county is increasing its growth goals considering the declining population and also why we're, the county seems to be wanting to um, de kind of let more housing be built. I mean, my guess is, I guess you can answer this, but my guess is that's because the plan is to reverse the trend of population decline. Um, I know in particular, this that um, you know Santa Cruz has often been a place people like to retire to, but in the end, that tends a declining population growth can lead to us becoming more like some midwestern towns that become ghost towns over time because people uh, sort of leave, and so we're trying to encourage more people to come and live here to try to reverse those trends. I know in my area in Boulder Creek, we had to close uh, when I was a little kid. Um, because of the declining growth rate, we had to close two of our elementary schools um, and also close, I believe, one of our middle schools as well. Um, so I, I think that's, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume when I saw the plan, I assumed that that was why you're increasing the uh, growth goal and trying to make it easier to build more like multifamily housing is to try to reverse those trends, um, which is something that I, I very highly approve of. I'd like to see more housing, especially like uh, duplexes um, or apartments get built. I'd like to be able to live um, in Santa, like near like the center of Santa Cruz someday where I could, you know, I don't have to drive down to, to you know, go hang out with my friends who live there. <laughs> so that would be nice. Um, keep housing prices down. Um, yeah, that's what I had to say. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay. Um, I am, now I am seeing uh, Mando Morlos. Um, good morning again. Please restate your name for the record. Good morning. This is uh, Mando Morlos. And I had a question to you guys. Uh, um, maybe you can use the remainder of my time to answer that. How far behind are we in residential units by whatever matrix are used, either by uh, the state or by local? If anyone can answer that, I'd really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. We'll, um, we'll listen to all of the public comments first, and I'll turn it back over to the Planning Commission. Um, are there any additional members of the public who wish to speak on this item? If so, um, please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or using the hand icon. All right, I'm not seeing any, Chair, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your comments. We really appreciate it. And um, 
this time we can close the public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion. And I'd like to open it to any commissioners to ask any other questions or comments. And um, you know, if at some point I'd love to hear some of the responses on some of the public questions as well. Maybe we could start there unless another commissioner had a uh, really wanted to go first. Okay, let's do that. Um, one question in particular, a couple people asked was, why are we raising the uh, population growth? And I, if you could just explain that, that'd be helpful. I'll take a crack at, at that. Natisha can uh, follow up with numbers. The, uh, the growth goal, uh, the way we kind of project the units is designed to reflect the way we see the trends moving. Um, uh, yes, there has been a decline um, for various reasons. It's been an unusual couple of years um, with, with COVID um, in, in particular. However, um, for the reasons that Natisha explained in this the uh, presentation, um, we have a number of pipeline projects that will come into permitting. Um, we anticipate that the initiatives out of the state that are designed to start to increase housing um, will uh, uh, start to take effect. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors that go into you know whether we see things continuing to go down um, or increasing. Um, we don't we don't see that the decline will continue if some of these factors really come into play. So um, we uh, we would probably never recommend a negative growth goal to the planning commission or the board um, because we really don't want it to uh, restrict our ability to to build in any way. Um, so 0.5 is pretty low and we did have it uh, in the past two years we had 0.25 reflecting about as low as we can go um, but we we are hopeful that um, growth will continue and even start to increase in, in the rate of the number of units built. Um, the purpose of trying to encourage housing is that um, while there are state mandates, we also just need housing here. We need affordable housing. We need housing options for all people in our community, um, not just wealthy people who have vacation homes. Um, so it's a you know, when we talk about the housing crisis, I would say we're a good we're a good candidate for um, what that where you can find the housing crisis. Um, and then there are state mandates for how many units we're supposed to be able to accommodate. Um, and so while I'm at it, I'll just kind of say we're about two thirds of the way there, um, and have about a year to go on that arena. So we we it is very unlikely we will make that number. Can um, that, uh, chair. I, um, yes, Commissioner Sharp. Um, I think I want to say that the growth goal was a, you know, it was something the voters voted on in a much different era. There was a proposal um, out by the lighthouse to build a community of 30,000 people. And this was in reaction to um, large developers' plans to develop this area in a much different way. Uh, times have changed. Um, we don't have enough housing for people who really want to live here of normal means. On the other hand, it's the hottest housing market in the country for rentals or second or something. And unfortunately, housing prices continue to climb. So it's a much different community than this kind of the growth control measure, which is kind of an artifact actually um, manifests, but it is still emblematic of the fact that one thing doesn't change is people want this to be continue to be a nice place to live and don't want to kill the goose who lays the golden eggs of why it's special to live in Santa Cruz. So our task as a public and as a government is to figure out how to have more housing, affordable housing, enable people who grew up here to stay here without making it, uh, you know, like many fabled Southern California communities are over the hill. But 
So, so we are dealing with this every year because it's mandated. So if it doesn't always seem to make sense, it's because it was voted on in a time when people felt like we were going to become Los Angeles very quickly. I'd just like to thank Renee for that history and background. And in conjunction with that lighthouse field plan was also a like five lane freeway that was proposed to go down where Delaware Avenue is currently. So yeah, there is some history to this. So it's important to understand that history to understand why we are here right now. Um, and then I'd just like to say also that we are not alone. Um, as being a community that is um, an example of one that's suffering from a housing crisis. You know, as Stephanie pointed out, we are one of, of dozens and dozens of communities across the whole country. So I don't wanna make it seem like it's just a Santa Cruz thing. Um, this is something that's a nationwide problem. Very good. Thank you everyone for that input. That was really beneficial for me. Um, uh, I'm ready to make a motion if we're ready to have one. Great, I'm ready. Yep. Let's uh, move the staff recommendation. I'll second it. Okay, great. We have a motion and a second. And if there's no further discussion, we can move on to a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Drake. <clears throat> Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, with that, we can close agenda item number seven. Moving right along and move on to uh, agenda item number eight. This is a public hearing to consider the proposed ordinances and resolutions related to the sustainability policy update and um, a recommendation to the board. Chair Gordon, um, could I just say something real quick before we get started? Yes. Um, and that is there was a public comment during oral communications that was kind of starting to question um, the process a little bit and um, suggesting that the times of our meetings, um, you know, are convenient, which I understand most certainly is true for a number of people. But I just wanted to make sure to point out and recognize that I think staff has done an excellent job at planning meetings at a variety of times throughout this process um, so that people with a whole different schedules can make it. So all of the community meetings last spring were in the evening, which I heard from a number of people was like an absolutely terrible time for them because they have young kids and that's like the worst time when you have little kids to attend a public meeting. I also have heard from students who are young people who have told me that the mornings are great times for them because they don't usually start their day with classes until the afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to commend our staff for providing a number of opportunities throughout the day for people to participate and just put it out there for folks who are listening that from my perspective, written correspondence is actually the, the best way to communicate because you can be as detailed as you want. I, for instance, just got an email this morning from someone in the district asking about something. She cited a specific part of the plan. I was able to look it up and I might be asking a question about that this afternoon. So I would just encourage folks to use written correspondence. Um, we all read it and it's really helpful. So thank you. And Chair Gordon, if I may, actually, sure. I appreciate Chair, Chair, uh, Commissioner Dan saying that because I was actually going to respond to that comment as well. I, um, I understand that some people don't always learn about some of these hearings until late, but this process has been going on for quite some time. And I, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that there have been several opportunities to participate through a numerous nighttime he um, hearings, but all the, so the, these were then recorded and available online at an alternate opportunity. So people weren't able to participate um, live in those nighttime opportunities. They were also recorded so that people could do exactly what Commissioner Dan is talking about, which is then communicating in a written format um, with the commission or even staff um, to to participate in this process. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear um, that people when learned about this process today, that's always unfortunate because we want people to engage. We want people to be able to participate, but I, I do think staff should be commended um, on providing a multitude of opportunities and 
and putting that out. I know that this, the county did press releases of all of every single one of those opportunities for each one. They didn't just put out the master schedule, but they then released each hearing. Um, and we did have participation and then each of those opportunities was then recorded and put online. So I do think that they've done a good job. I know that no time is ideal for everybody. Um, as Commissioner Dan said, mornings can be bad for people who work, evenings can be bad for people with small children or who are caregivers in general. Uh, so I know that that's, but that's why we provided this diverse opportunity of times. And so I just, I wanna make sure that we res respond when, when there are sometimes these statements that there are only one opportunity, that's certainly not the case here. Um, and so I just, I do, I do feel that sometimes we need to respond to comments like that, that, that um, characterize these things as, as being singular or last minute, which this, uh, I agree with the, the comments that this is a large, large change and um, but I feel like staff has done a good job of responding accordingly in terms of providing opportunity. Uh, Chair Gordon. Sure, please Commissioner Shepard. Uh, I had two cents to add to that. When, yes, what I heard from the public is that they didn't get that the sustainability update is really a general, a review of the general plan. I think I have nomenclature here because a lot of people didn't get that. That's what I heard. So I'd like to suggest that when the board advertises their hearings on this topic, that the word, the fact that we are updating and changing the general plan, somehow that language gets involved because the word sustainability, um, people don't know what it means. So I do want to say that. And I wanted to let anybody who's still here remind them that they have, still have plenty of time to participate. This all gets goes before the Board of Supervisors and gets discussed in detail again. So I think Commissioner Dan is absolutely right. Get a hold of a copy, look it up online, and then put your comments in writing to your um, supervisor because they do get read. There is one thing that I, when I did talk to Annie about a few things and I wanted to bring it up again, reading it online is of course useful um, and saves paper, but I have found it real difficult if you're looking uh, at a chart or a grid and you look on one page and then three pages later, it shows what's changed or what's different. It's not really hard to go back and forth, scoot down three pages and try to remember what you saw three pages ago. So uh, I think these complicated documents, if you could put them up si with side-by-side -side pages so you can at least compare things. I that or at least put a printed copy in, in the library or at the planning department so people actually want to come and compare parts of, uh, you know, some of the uh, grids of what's permitted and what's what the changes are. I had a hard time finding what the changes were compared to, said what they will be, but didn't say what they were, or if it did, it was a few pages different. Uh, is it possible to have the documents an option for, for pages being side side like a book so you can refer back and forth easily. That's one suggestion I had, but uh, I just want to say that. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, obviously second everything everyone said. So um, with that, I will move on with a couple housekeeping items on this topic. Just as a reminder, we have an 1130 lunch break today. So 30 minutes at 1130, and we'll just take a hard stop at 1130 um, as long as we're not in the middle of the presentation or you know something that was a really awkward spot to stop at, you know, plus or minus a couple minutes there. Um, second thing on this topic is we do have a, a rough hard stop today or close to one o'clock. And so, you know, my recommendation would be that we, you know, and I'm going to follow Ms. Hansen's lead here because she's kind of got the plan to how to get us through these things one at a time, um, but that we kind of find a rough stopping point around then and, and would move to continue to the next hearing for motions on any of the topics. Um, well, I, I'd like to discuss that. I don't think we're going to get this through this thing by one o'clock. And we only have one other meeting. I would be okay with going ahead and getting everything done this afternoon. And I know that's a burden for Allison, but either that or just have another extra meeting. I, I don't see how we can get everything done in one meeting in September. I think Commissioner Lazenby also has to leave by 1.30. So that would be two commissioners that would be leaving between 1 and 1.30. So I'm wondering 
if that would be it. Let me, can I propose something? Why don't um, we go forward here, the staff presentation, and then um, those commissioners, and then we try to get through as much as we can, um, and then make a call at 120 and see where we are and what we need to do next. Does that sound good? I, I that think sounds so. good, but yeah. I want to at least yeah. to open the option of having uh, another half day meeting. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's discuss that. Like, let's let's stop like ten minutes before the hard stop, whenever that is, and then um, have that discussion. Leave ten minutes for that discussion. I, I just want to make sure that is possible. If we had another extra meeting for like you know four hours, anything's possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually this is where Stephanie says, "Well, you can't afford the time, and it has to go to the board, and so on." So well, I want to make sure I'm not going to guess. I would guess that we would schedule that before the 14th. Yes. Yeah, so we could stay on schedule. But yeah, okay, sounds good. Great, okay, so I think we're all pretty much on the same page, great. Um, so with that, then we can move on. And Ms. Hansen, if you could give us a little bit of an outline of you know what our process will be, that'd be really helpful for me. Um, so we can kind of, you know, march through this one at a time and then obviously staff presentation and go from there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Gordon and, and commissioners. I, I see I have a reputation to work on in terms of trying to keep <laughs> us uh, focused and, and um, Commissioner Dan is, is right. There is an opportunity for more meetings, certainly, um, and it'd be helpful to have them in between um, before 914 if possible. Um, so, uh, uh, Chair Gordon and I were have been discussing how to organize our review here um, in uh, in an orderly fashion that's kind of clear to everybody, so that um, we can uh, uh, get everybody's input and have it um, be straightforward for. For people, it can get kind of crazy with motions when folks are making motions. So, um, what we talked about is uh, for today, we're going to do the staff presentation. We'd like to be able to get through the whole presentation, um, and then um, what we're recommending to to the chair is that before any commission comment. Um, we go, we open the public hearing and, and hear from the people who are attending and waiting, um, especially with uh, such a large project. We want to make sure that the people have taken time to be here, uh, can, can have their input um, and, you know, aren't, don't have to return and aren't required to kind of um, come back at a later date when they've been waiting for, for hours. So, um, we, we're recommending that we go right to public comment, and then um, and then we can have commission discussion after that. Um, uh, and we understand that it may uh, not all happen today. Um, uh, and we're hoping if there's you know if there's di 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 any direction that the commission wants to offer to staff that we're um, that we get we get that. Um, and then when it comes time to make the motions, which I, I am hearing would not probably not happen today because I think there is some discussion that needs to happen. Um, we'll, we'll work with Chair Gordon to, to break out the documents so that we're accepting motions first on the, uh, first you would have um, the straight out motion to you know recommend approval as as the staff recommendation is and then we would have a series of amending motions we start with the general plan and then we'll go through it chapter by chapter so um, chair would call out and say any what are any comments on the built environment element on introduction built environment um, access and mobility and we'll just go down down the line <clears throat> Um, of all the chapters of the general plan. And then basically we do the same thing for the county code, break it out um, for search title five and title 12. Those are fairly minor. I don't think we'd have too much there. 
um, chapter 1310, which is the big one and will take some time, chapter 1311 and, and so forth until we get through all the chapters and the title and the code. Um, then we'll move to the third component, which is the design guidelines and if, see if there's any amending motions there. Uh, then the fourth component would be map amendments and see if there's any motions there. Um, so you'll see in the staff report, we've tweaked the uh, recommendation just a little bit because there are items that we know we're coming back for on 9-14. So the, um, the recommendation is uh, shifted a, a teeny bit for that. Um, uh, and so I, I think that, that that would cover it. And then um, that'll get us through kind of today, we can have a reminder at your uh, at the continued hearing, whether that's on 914 or before, um, and then kind of pick up where we uh, left off at, at that point. And then, um, uh, so I anticipate some discussion before we get to the motion part of this, and, and that's probably the best way to do it anyway. So um, do you, did I... Did I cover that up? Okay, Chair? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. I think that's really clear. So, you know, we'll get through a discussion today and then as you do motions one at a time. And so, you know, as commissioners are, um, you know, kind of thinking through responses and, and getting ready for the coming weeks uh, or coming sessions of, of making motions, I just ask that, you know, try to organize in that fashion, you know, general plan intro, then built environment, you know, et cetera, county code by each title then design guidelines, then map amendments, as Ms. Hansen said. I think that then we can really walk through these uh, much more easily. So thank you so can much. I, can I just ask, Chair, it's yes, okay yes, to organize please. your comments and suggestions by going by the staff uh, report um, organization. That's how I have them right now. Is that what you kind of meant? Um, yes, uh, kind oh. of. I, I think that... Ideally, we would vote in in sections of general plan and then sections of code. Um, so it would be one um, one um, motion to approve with amendments, and then each separate amendment would be based on those sections. Uh, and I'll I'll just so say it generally does follow the staff report organization. Okay. Yeah, good because I I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, there's these three three inch volumes here, and. I have trouble figuring out what to call everything since everything's name is kind of different. Anyway. Understood. Thank you. Um, Chair, I, yes. I just wanted to be clear, and maybe I misheard, but this um, suggested organization, which I think makes sense, um, is for when we take action on the 14th. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. So, yes, that would be it. So then we can really clearly adjust certain sections um, as a group. Yeah. Um, and then, yep. you know, I think that if there are kind of voluminous um, amended, you know, suggestions to add into a motion, it's probably helpful to put those on a separate document so that we can all share screens if possible. Um, because reading, you know, if I have, you know, recommended changes that run two or three pages, to have to read those aloud will be too much. So what I'm doing is preparing separate Google Docs for all of those, which then, um, you know, if we're still remote, which I imagine we will be, you know, we can share screens or send them to staff and staff can put them up for a discussion. That's okay. how I'm doing it. That's an awesome idea. Is that possible, Ms. Hansen, as we go through to co combine these and, you know, someone can be typing them as we're saying them so we can like read through it as a group? You know exactly what our amendments are and then agree to that document um it, staff wouldn't be typing as we go along i think what uh commissioner dan is saying is she's preparing a document with her so, proposed changes and she'll so share will. her screen so you can all visually see it instead of her having to say one thing after another because i i know that um she's um been conducting a detailed re review so that's excellent um, so it wouldn't be an iter iterative thing. Um, and then staff will have to figure out how to go, based on the discussion, go back and come back with changes on the 14th. That makes sense. I just don't quite understand. So I understand that we are, and I don't want to, I know, obviously we need to get on with it, but we're going to hear the staff report. We're going to hear from the public. 
and we may or may not have more time today. We're going to consider an additional meeting. At that meeting, we can give comments on this which was under consideration for today. And in, in that case, I, I don't have any complicated Google Docs, but I have some suggested changing and wording things I don't agree with and why I don't agree with them. And, and that's what I was planning to do. And then the 14th, that's a kind of place to kind of have the staff should, by then would be res, responding to her suggestions, and, and that would be the final wrap-up, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I maybe I shouldn't have, you know, weighed in on this. I think everybody should should prepare how, in a way that works for them. So, yeah, I think with, you know, the way you do, the way you operate is, is just fine. So, yeah. I think okay. that to be clear, though, um, we are going to provide feedback. And then before the last hearing or before a motion, we would have an updated response from the planning department on our comments, correct? For the majority of things, if assuming we can get through it before we go to make motions, if it's day of changes, then obviously it would need to be an amended motion, but. I, I'm gonna, I think we'll have to see what they are, right? Um, yeah. If we're, if we're getting the sense that there's kind of unanimous agreement from the commissioners, then I think we could come back with that change. There may be some items that the commission doesn't agree on. And in, in that case, we would ask the commission to, you know, make the motion and then we'll see how the votes go. And then, um, so it's going to be probably a little bit of a mix. If it's, <laughs> if it's real clear cut, we can bring it back and then, um, but if it's something that we're seeing may, people may have differing opinions on, then that, that'll need to be motion driven. So there's a vote on them. That makes sense. And that reflects what you've done so far. I mean, if we look at like what's in the packet from the last meeting, you responded to some things, changed some things, right. Um, responding and but not everything so that's just something we then have to go bird dog and then make determinations on our own what we want to do with that so yeah some some of these things are policy questions and that's why we're here at the commission to have the commission set the policy help set the policy for the board that makes sense to me thanks Stephanie yes thank you Probably move on then uh, to the presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'll get us started today. Um, welcome everybody. We're very excited to be here at the uh, first hearing. Um, uh, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the public outreach that we've conducted so far. I um, I know for some people this is new, but as um, uh, commissioner, commissioners Dan and Violante mentioned, it has been somewhat extensive. Um, so I'll be presenting today, and um, with me today also presenting is Daisy Allen and uh, Annie Murphy, both senior planners. Um, we also have Anais Shank, who is our transportation planner. Um, Natisha Williams is with us on deck. She's sharing her screen and helping the project um, with the presentation. Also with us today are Stephanie Strilo and I think Catherine Wade, um, who are with DUDEC, who prepared the environmental impact report and can help us if there's any questions about, about that report. Okay, so a little bit of uh, organization here. Um, we'll begin with a review of the background goals and outreach for this project, um, follow uh, by an uh, overview of the general plan amendments. Um, and then as we've been talking about, the county code amendments and the design guidelines, um, the map amendments, um, and then We'll just uh, do a quick overview on the final environmental impact report as well. Um, for today's discussion, we're going to be fairly focused on the changes that we've made since the original draft documents have uh, come out in February. Um, these are meant to reflect um, changes that staff saw, as well as um, planning commission comments that we've received along the way. 
Um, as always, we encourage folks to visit the project website to view the changes. The new ones are highlighted in yellow on, on, the, um, on the documents. And, um, uh, and also the, um, all of the, the presentations and community meetings that we have had over the, the last um, months are also posted on the project website. We'll, we'll show the link for that um, as we move along here. Okay, so a little bit more background. Um, the sustainability update, um, which is a regulatory and policy update to our general plan and county code has four main components. There's amendments to the general plan, which includes our local coastal program, amendments to the county code, which implements the general plan. There are new county design guidelines that are proposed. And then there are amendments to the land use and zoning map uh, maps. And we'll, we'll discuss each of these components in more detail as we go along in this presentation. The sustainability update has several project goals. Um, the first one is to implement the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, which was a planning study um, accepted by the board back in 2014. Um, the project aims also aims to um, streamline and update and modernize our development codes. Um, and that incorporates the code modernization effort that began in 2013. Um, when you put these things together, we, um, we are hoping to implement a vision for more sustainable urban communities. Um, the amendments primarily deal with our urban areas. Um, the project also addresses projected growth. Um, Santa Cruz County, like all uh, jurisdictions, is required under planning law to plan and accommodate for a certain amount of population, housing, and economic growth. So the update of the general plan is a 20-year document, um, has a 20-year planning horizon from 2020 to 2040. And finally, consistency with newly adopted county plans and state legislation, regional plans um, also informs the project. Uh, planning law requires that jurisdictions reflect and be consistent with a variety of state laws, um, as well as the regional plans for the area and the California Coastal Act um, for jurisdictions like ours that are, that are near the coast. Uh, so, you know, a little bit about the um, outreach that has, has been done so far. The, um, this is a multi-year process, and the uh, draft documents were uh, released uh, back in February of this year. Um, and last week, we updated them to reflect the new changes that we've talked about and the Planning Commission's feedback so far. Um, the new drafts include some minor changes that are kind of more cleanup items, as well as items from the uh, Planning Commission, as I mentioned. Um, and feedback from the public too. Um, we're including additional staff analysis and input from other agencies. All substantive changes are shown in underline and strike through and highlighted in yellow. Um, outreach for the sustainability update builds on previous visioning and public meetings that were um, originally completed for the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Um, which had a variety of community meetings and, you know, and was really a visioning process for our urban areas. Um, there were also several meetings that were conducted from um, 2011 through 2015 related to modernizing the code. Our uh, website for the project was launched in 2020 and provides access to all the documents um, as well as summaries, um, fact sheets in English and in Spanish. Um, provides a variety of opportunities to um, comment on the project and the documents. Includes a project survey that people can take. Um, and as of August 5th, we've received 155 surveys back. Um, those are exhibit M in the Planning Commission packet. 
The project website also includes a public comment portal, um, which provides an open forum. So far, we've received more than 100 written comments, and those are included in your packet as Exhibit L. We've done a social media campaign and email outreach, which has been extensive, reaching over 3,000 members of the community with every email. Um, this list also includes the stakeholders and groups and local agencies and community organizations and those folks who have commented and reached out to us. We had uh, seven community meetings this spring that focused on various uh, topics. Uh, community meetings had over 160 attendees and recordings of the meetings are also available on the project website. Between May and August of this year, we conducted 10 study sessions at a variety of county commissions to review major updates proposed for the project and identify recommended changes. There were four here at the Planning Commission, but also we visited the Housing Advisory Commission, the Latino Affairs Commission, the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission, um, and a couple of different bodies at the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, and so that's a little bit of background on our outreach. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Daisy, who can begin the discussion on the general plan. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so the amendments to the general plan include updates to five chapters. Chapter one, the introduction has been rewritten to focus on sustainability and to align with recent uh, local, regional, and state planning efforts. Chapter two, land use, has also been rewritten and has been renamed the built environment element. And it integrates the existing general plan chapter two, land use, and chapter eight, community design, uh, with a focus on residential and commercial development. The built environment element and the related code updates were reviewed at the Planning Commission study session on June 8th, uh, for anyone looking for more information about that. Um, chapter three, circulation, has been renamed the access and mobility element to reflect a focus on movement of people rather than movement of vehicles. This chapter and related transportation regulations were reviewed at the Planning Commission study session on June 22nd. The concepts in the built environment element are strongly linked to transportation concepts in access and mobility in order to focus new development along transportation corridors and to promote the goals of sustainable development. Um, the project also partially amends Chapter 5, the Conservation and Open Space element, renamed Agriculture, Resources, and Conservation. Changes to this chapter focus on substantive updates to agricultural policies, updates to policies for groundwater, timber, and other resources to ensure consistency with state law and to implement best management practices. Partial amendments are also proposed for Chapter 7, Parks, Recreation, and Public Facilities, to be consistent with the park's strategic plan and to ensure that county facilities are adequate to accommodate projected growth. Changes to these chapters were reviewed at the August 10th and June 22nd Planning Commission study sessions, respectively. The general plan glossary and appendices have also been updated to align with updates to these five chapters of the general plan. And all the draft general plan chapters, as well as the glossary and appendices, are available on the project website, as Stephanie mentioned. Uh, the remaining three general plan chapters will not be updated as part of this project. Those chapters include chapter four, housing, which is scheduled to be amended in 2023, chapter six, public safety, which was amended by the board in 2020 based on commission recommendations and is currently pending certification by the Coastal Commission, and chapter nine, which will now be chapter eight, noise, which was amended in 2019. Um, so then now we'll go ahead and explain several key substantive changes that have been made to the draft general plan amendments based on feedback received from the public and from the planning commission since February of this year. Um, the staff report provides a detailed analysis of all of the substantive changes, um, and uh, they're all highlighted in yellow uh, in Exhibit F of your packet, as Stephanie mentioned. And uh, although not all the topics uh, will be included in this presentation, we're happy to talk about any other changes the commission would like to discuss today. Okay, so there's a couple of key changes to note on the built environment element um, since the public draft was initially released in February. Um, regarding residential development and density, staff received a lot of comments about the new proposed land use designations. 
uh, the, uh, sorry, the new proposed land use designation, residential urban high flex and the associated RF zone district. Uh, this designation and zone district have been updated to allow ground floor commercial development in order to address the concern about the potential loss of commercial land uses on sites that are zoned RF along commercial corridors, such as Portola Drive. Um, staff did stop short of requiring ground floor commercial uses in the RF district in order to maintain flexibility for developers and to keep the focus in this district on the provision of housing. Um, staff is not proposing changes to the proposed density range of 22 to 45 units per acre um, in residential urban high flex. Comments were received that this density was too high and comments were also received that it is too low. Um, this indicates to staff that the proposed density may be about right uh, for the highest density residential district in the community at this time. Uh, when the uh, Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan was developed, an early estimate of the maximum density that could be achieved in this district was 60 units per acre. However, a maximum density of 45 units per acre encourages developers wishing to achieve higher densities to incorporate affordable units and pursue the density bonus program. Um, note that for the RF zone district, zone district, staff is proposing updates to open space and floor area ratio standards, which I'll discuss a little bit later when we get into the county code portion of this presentation. Um, regarding commercial development and density, staff conducted initial additional analysis uh, to address concerns raised by commissioners and members of the public about the proposed maximum floor area ratio of 1.0 for commercial land use designations. The concern was that this FAR was too low to support the intensity of development needed, particularly for housing in mixed use projects and for projects with underground garages or podium parking, which is an above ground parking garage with commercial or residential development above. Um, staff found that for commercial developments with surface parking, a maximum floor area ratio of one um, is generally sufficient because the square footage required for parking, it becomes the limiting factor for development. Um, however, staff is proposing two updates to commercial FAR to accommodate cases where the required parking square footage is reduced. Um, and these updates would apply to uh, mixed use projects as well. Um, so the first update would be increasing FAR from 1 to 1.5 for all commercial land use designations except industrial in order to ensure that FAR does not limit commercial development for projects uh, where surface parking requirements are greatly reduced. And then secondly, for projects that uh, accommodate at least 75% of their parking with a multi-story garage, underground garage, or podium parking, those projects would now be exempt uh, from maximum FAR. So that would ensure that FAR is not a limiting factor to development of those types of projects, and that aligns with the proposed policies and design guidelines promoting uh, these various alternatives to surface parking lots. Um, and then finally, as a result of coordination with coastal staff on the draft built environment element, staff made two key policy updates. Um, policy, uh, the policy regarding conversion of coastal priority uses was updated to address each use separately and add more specificity as to what criteria would allow for such a conversion. And staff is continuing to coordinate with coastal staff on this policy and it's, uh, it may be tweaked further um, as that coordination continues. Um, and then secondly, it was determined that it will not be possible to update policies related to the existing memorandum of understanding between the County Coastal uh, Commission and City of Watsonville regarding development west of Watsonville without considerable coordination between the MOU parties and an update to the MOU itself. Um, so for that reason, uh, the existing general plan policies and programs regarding this MOU have been retained and moved to uh, a new objective uh, within the built environment element. Um, uh, and uh, I'll also note that at the Planning Commission study session on June 8th, there was a request for more information regarding the proposed change to calculate urban residential density using gross site area rather than net developable site area. And staff did provide an example uh, with analysis in the staff report uh, and can uh, clarify further if the commission would like. Um, now I'll uh, hand it over to Anis to discuss updates to the access and mobility element. Thanks, Daisy. Uh, so the key changes in the access and mobility element relate to transportation demand management. 
and responding to comments from the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, we often just say SSC, SRTC, excuse me. <clears throat> and changes related to the TDM uh, include a new appendix, which was added to bring clarity on uh, TDM options for applicants. So that's appendix I of the general plan, which includes categories of design measures so people can see which measures are related to infrastructure and therefore one-time investments versus measures that are ongoing uh, and require monitoring. Uh, and these are labeled as incentives in the appendix. Also, a new general plan strategy was added to consider allowing paid parking and other parking strategies as TDM options beyond what is provided in Appendix I. This is based on EIR mitigation for CEQA impacts related to VMT, as well as input from the first and fifth district supervisors. There will be more discussion of CEQA at the end of this presentation. A number of changes were made based on comments in coordination with the SCCRTC. I'm just going to say RTC for the ease of uh, speaking here. Uh, these include updating language in the chapter introduction to acknowledge benefits of reducing VMT other than greenhouse gas reductions, as well as updating text related to the locally preferred alternative for the rail corridor, uh, which was based on the transit alternatives analysis conducted by RTC. Also, language around Vision Zero policies and implementation strategies was updated to correspond to best practice Vision Zero philosophy. Additional changes include generalizing policy language related to Metro's upgrades, adding transit to potential multimodal impacts that new development should consider when analyzing level of service, and policy changes to address accessibility based on public feedback. At the Planning Commission study session on June 22nd, commissioners requested additional information to help clarify some other concepts presented in the access mobility element, including high quality transit, Dutch intersection, uh, the difference between level of service and uh, VMT or vehicle miles traveled. Uh, so those have been provided in the staff report starting on page 11 of your packet. Uh, during that study session, planning commissioners also requested clarity on the Portola Drive streetscape concepts that are analyzed in the EIR and to what extent and how they will be implemented. Uh, the Portola Drive improvements are conceptual in nature and include both near and long-term concepts. Before these concepts can be implemented, there would need to be further engineering and design to provide more detail than the draft concepts provide. Projects would need to be added to the capital improvement program and grant funding would be required. The streetscape concepts are referred, referenced in the access and mobility element and Appendix J of the general plan. Appendix J is the appendix that includes future roadways and intersection improvements. The commission may consider an amendment to this appendix to uh, further analyze improvements related to the Portola street, Drive streetscape concepts. Uh, and staff also recommends removal of the term adopted in the introductory language to the appendix. So now I'm going to pass it back to Annie to talk about uh, the ARC element. Thank you, Anise. <laughs> Changes have been made to policies in the agricultural, natural resources, and conservation element related to agricultural land and visual resources to address comments from your commission. Regarding agricultural policies, both your commission and the Coastal Commission were concerned that amendments allowing for the expansion of water and sewer districts to serve CA parcels were overly broad and could lead to the conversion of agricultural land. In response, policies have been amended in coordination with the water resources staff to clarify that water and sewer districts could be expanded to serve CA parcels only where necessary to serve existing development with failing septic systems or with wells that do not meet state drinking water standards. Staff did discuss with Water Resources the idea of limiting the size of service lines or requiring a non-access strip around these lines. However, Water Resources staff was concerned that these amendments uh, may inhibit the ability to extend service where needed and believes that the proposed language provides appropriate safeguards for agricultural land. Regarding the placement of new water and sewer lines on CA land in the coastal zone, Previous amendments that would have allowed new water and sewer lines to serve public facility uses on CA have been deleted. The provisions allowing the placement of water and sewer lines to recharge groundwater or reduce saltwater intrusion 
has also been updated to apply only to areas served by the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency or PV Water. PV Water supplies recycled water to parcels in the district, including CA parcels, in order to reduce saltwater intrusion and recharge the groundwater, which is essential both to protect public health and the long-term viability of commercial agriculture. Policy language has also been amended to clarify that hookup to trunk lines may be permitted where necessary to provide water and sewer service to CA parcels where otherwise allowed in the general plan. Um, moving on now to public and quasi-public uses on CA land. In response to Planning Commission comments from the August 10th study session, as well as Coastal Commission comments regarding the conversion of commercial ag land to accommodate public quasi-public uses, staff has proposed additional amendments to protect commercial agricultural land and ensure consistency with the Coastal Act. These changes have been provided as replacement pages to your packets with changes highlighted in green. The previous general plan draft included a new general use category of public quasi-public use that would be allowed on both CA and A parcels intended to accommodate a variety of essential public facility uses. In the updated draft, this broad use category would no longer be allowed on CA. However, the draft retains and adds references to the specific community and public facility uses allowed on CA in the agricultural uses chart. This approach will allow appropriate community and public facility uses to be added to CA in the future, while otherwise limiting new public facility uses to those currently allowed in the ag uses chart. Language has also been retained that allows a landfill as well as a transfer station on CA accommodating the Buena Vista landfill site. Staff has also deleted the new provision that would have allowed the conversion or subdivision of CA land to accommodate a public facility use. The new public quasi-public use as a general category would continue to be allowed on A zone parcels, expanding sites where PF uses can currently be considered. Minor changes have been made to policies in chapter five and other general plan chapters to address comments from the drainage division of the CDI department, which ensure consistency with county design criteria and best management practices. Your commission requested additional information regarding deletion of septic policies. John Ricker has clarified that the deleted policies include very specific requirements that are better addressed in the county code. Um, and was also mentioned, John Ricker uh, recently brought to your commission an update to the county code and septic policies um, to be consistent with the county's local management program for on-site wastewater treatment. And once these are approved, these policies will be included in the general plan. Staff has also made several changes to policies for visual resources. Policy language regarding development visible from a public beach has been clarified removing the phrase adversely visible and retaining the intent of the existing policy. Uh, there was also discussion about retaining the existing policy language that does not allow the creation of new parcels, which would require structures to project above the ridge line. Language has been added to retain this policy intent and other policy language has been clarified. Finally, regarding the proposed amendments to remove the local scenic designation for the urban portions of Highway 1, Commissioners expressed concern about the loss of trees along the highway. Per commission comments, a new strategy has been added to direct the county to coordinate with Caltrans to replant trees along the urban portions of Highway 1. This strategy will help screen new development, enhance the urban forest, and improve the visual qualities of the highway corridor while allowing uh, development to proceed along, on sites along the highway within the USL. The second component of the sustainability update project is amendments to the county code. These amendments include updates to Title 12 building and Title 13 planning and zoning regulations, which include changes to zoning, design, and coastal regulation chapters, as well as the new parking and circulation chapter. Title 18 procedures has also been updated, and there are also other minor associated changes to Titles 5 and 15. Key amendments to the code include a new permit system, replacing the current processing levels with more descriptive permit terms, the creation of the new residential flex zone district, 
in a new workplace flex zone district that provides centers of employment with a flexible mix of commercial and light industrial land uses meeting the daily needs of workers. Code updates also include new agricultural and event regulations, updated zone district use charts, revised design review regulations, and revised development standards for several districts, including new mixed use standards. Overall, these code amendments serve to both modernize the code and align with general plan changes. <clears throat> Updates related to the new zone districts were reviewed at the June 8th study session, and code modernization was discussed with your commission on August 12th. Today's presentation will focus on key changes to the code related to agricultural and event regulations, animal keeping and transportation, as well as development standards. The staff report provides detailed analysis of all substantive changes to draft county code amendments since they were last presented to your commission. These changes are highlighted in yellow in exhibit G of your packet. Um, and although we are not discussing all topics in the presentation, we're happy to talk about any other code changes your commission would like to discuss. <laughs> Regarding changes to agricultural regulations, the Coastal Commission com commented that amendments allowing new or expanded ancillary uses should include standards to limit the conversion of agricultural land. In response, for several agricultural support uses, staff has added back in size caps on the development area, which is the total area that can be covered by structures or materials that may impact the agricultural soil. The reinstated size caps have been previously considered by the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission and the Farm Bureau, who found the proposed caps acceptable. To address Coastal Commission comments and concerns regarding cumulative impacts on agricultural land resulting from multiple ancillary uses on the same site, staff has amended the county code to limit the total development area of a site for residential and ancillary support uses to 60,000 square feet. This cap is sufficient to accommodate agricultural processing facilities, uh, large agricultural storage areas serving multiple parcels, or sites that may have a residence as well as agricultural support uses, while limiting the conversion of agricultural land. Staff will also follow up at the September 14th hearing or future study session with updates to the county code to be consistent with general plan changes reviewed today regarding public facilities on CA land and water and sewer service to CA parcels. Staff has also made several changes to animal keeping regulations in response to Coastal Commission comments. Uh, regarding small animals, staff has updated code requirements to limit roosters, peacocks, and other noisy fowl to four birds per acre. For large animals, including horses, the side and rear setback requirements for paddocks has been reduced from 25 feet, previously proposed to 20 feet, which is the current minimum setback. Uh, in response to commission comments, planning staff has also followed up with environmental health staff who indicated that they differentiate between paddocks, which are unvegetated enclosures for horses and livestock, and larger pastures or turnout areas, which are vegetated. Environmental staff has clarified that the 20 foot setback should be applied to paddocks, but is not necessary for vegetated pastures. Staff is proposing to update the code accordingly and will bring this language to your commission on September 14th. A reference has also been added to the code uh, to manure management plans as required by environmental health. Responding to your planning commission comments that noticing proposed for community events in rural areas may not be sufficient, staff has updated noticing requirements, adding that when there are fewer than 10 parcels within 500 feet of the subject property, a 500 foot distance would be extended in increments of 50 feet until owners of at least 10 properties have been notified. The Planning Commission also asked whether events with fewer than 100 people are subject to the regulations for community events. Since community events are defined in part as nonprofit events with more than 100 guests, events with fewer than 100 guests would not be subject to regulations or noticing requirements for community events. However, such events will continue to be subject to code regulations 
protecting properties from offensive noise and regulations which declare it unlawful to host a loud or unruly gathering. Regarding commercial weddings, commissioners ask whether the code includes standards that specify the maximum number of guests or number of events allowed per year. The new regulations do establish appropriate zone districts, minimum parcel size, permit reviews, and noticing requirements. However, appropriate limits on event size and frequency may vary depending on the location and proximity to other residences, parcel size, road access, parking availability, potential noise impacts, and other factors. In the proposed regulations, limits on event size and frequency would be established during the discretionary review process with input from the required neighborhood meeting and noise studies where appropriate. Now, Anna East will review code changes related to access and mobility. So there's um, two sections to this slide. One is clarification on uh, questions that were asked previously, and then the other part is changes. Uh, so planning commissioners had asked for clarification at the study session on June 22nd about whether TDM requirements in the proposed code would apply to existing development. Uh, as was mentioned in the last session, TDM strategy or TDM requirements are not required for existing development. Staff has confirmed that this is uh, in the first section of that code. Uh, commissioners also requested additional information to understand how parking standards have changed and clarify whether those new standards would reduce or increase parking requirements for specific uses. Staff has prepared Exhibit J, which explains the existing and proposed parking ratios for various land uses and whether these changes result in fewer or more parking spaces required. Commissioners also requested information regarding why the parking standards are different for multifamily than single family residential development. Uh, the parking standards for multifamily are based on square feet rather than bedrooms to encourage smaller units that are more affordable by design. Uh, there's also a discussion related to this about market demand for parking. Uh, staff would like to know that there is guest parking provided for multifamily where there is not for single family. There was also a question about whether bicycle parking standards have been updated and whether there are exceptions that allow for vehicle parking reductions or vehicle parking maximums as a TDM strategy. The existing code prior to any proposed changes contains a provision for a maximum increase of 10% above the required parking and staff has not proposed to change this maximum. The proposed code does include an increase to bicycle parking ratios from the current existing ratios as well as includes requirements for secure bike parking, which is uh, parking that is covered in locking. The proposed code also includes a requirement for, uh, for providing shower facilities for specific land uses. Um, it includes an allowance to convert up to 10% of vehicle parking to bicycle parking, and staff has not proposed any changes to that proposed code uh, for the bicycle parking provisions. Uh, only supportive comments have been received thus far on, on those particular bicycle parking provisions. There are also parking reduction allowances that are carried over from the existing code that are not proposed to be changed at this time. For example, an allowance for shared parking is provided for in the existing code, and there are several, are several reductions based on state laws, such as for ADUs. Staff is not proposing to create a separate set of parking ratios for coastal areas, as was suggested as the goal of the modernization project was to simplify the code. However, there are a few changes um, to the parking that address comments made previously. Uh, based on the comments from uh, public, the large employer threshold for implementing TDM was reduced from 200 to 100 employees, and the language to explain uh, TDM requirements in the code was simplified, simplified wherever possible. A parking exception was provided, or, or is proposed as a change to allow parking reduction for residential projects of 10 or more units that are within the USL and within a one half mile of public transit. If those projects provide annual Metro passes, extra bike parking and charge separately for parking um, from the housing costs. And this change was made based on district one and district five supervisors direction. Also, the minimum amount of van parking required for commercial and tourist-based land uses was increased to two spaces, and this was made to accommodate people with disabilities uh, and a comment that the van ratios have been too low in the past, causing people to park far away. 
the guest parking requirement in the Loda Sells Dundasda, which includes Pleasure Point, was increased from 30 increased to 30% from 20%. And the reduction for projects within a one half mile of high quality transit was removed for these areas. Additionally, there was an, a new requirement for shared parking analysis for these areas, which uh, requires an analysis of visitor parking demand for the for those uses. Now, Daisy is going to discuss code changes related to building standards. Great. Uh, thank you, Anais. Um, so staff proposes several key updates to building standards from the February 2022 public draft. Um, in response to commissioner questions and after coordinating with development review staff, the shading study requirement has been added back into chapter 1311 to align with current practice and ensure that shade considerations are accounted for during design review. Also for commercial districts, FAR floor area ratio has been increased from one to 1.5 in alignment with the update to the general plan that I discussed earlier. And then finally, several updates are proposed to standards for the residential flex zone district. Uh, first, as explained earlier, in reference to the built environment element of the general plan, uh, staff proposes that commercial uses uh, should be allowed on the ground floor of the, the RF district. Second, in response to comments encouraging higher allowed density in the RF zone, staff proposes to increase um, the FAR allowed um, which will help uh, developers achieve the intended densities while not increasing the density range or height or lowering parking standards. Staff analysis indicates that for projects with surface parking, parking standards will continue to be the limiting factor in achieving the higher end of the density range. The RF zone district is intended to provide smaller affordable by design units and therefore the FAR standard of 1.1 provides an important check on development of large luxury units in the RF zone district especially in cases where parking standards are waived or reduced. For this reason, staff proposes an FAR standard of 1.1 for developments less than 30 units per acre and 1.5 for developments equal to or greater than 30 units per acre, uh, which ensures that FAR is not a limiting factor uh, for uh, the projects uh, that are higher density using density bonuses. Um, in addition, similarly to commercial districts, an exception to FAR standards for uh, RF developments is provided for uh, projects with underground uh, uh, multi-story garage or podium parking in order to encourage those more efficient alternatives to surface parking lots. Um, and then third, um, based on additional analysis, uh, staff proposes to increase the minimum open space requirement from 10% to 15% of growth site area for the RF district. Um, this reflects commission comments that open space is a key element to ensure quality high density developments um, and particularly important for uh, the new uh, RF zone, which proposes to increase the county's maximum urban residential density. Um, and staff uh, looked at several um, uh, examples of uh, projects that have already been built to RF density um, and those projects did incorporate um, uh, open space at about 15%. Um, okay, and then uh, next I wanted to um, take a moment to talk about planning commission project review. Um, so as Annie noted, uh, the amendments to the county code include uh, an introduction of a new use permit and site development permit framework. Um, so as part of that new permit framework, staff reviewed permit requirements for various project types and right-sized uh, approval levels where appropriate. Um, so no substantive changes are proposed uh, to these uh, procedures from the February 2022 public draft, but the commissioners did request a summary of typical project types that would be subject to planning commission review under the new permit framework. Uh, so we wanted to provide that information. Um, so overall uh, proposed changes allow some project types uh, to be approved administratively where a public hearing was previously required. And many project types are proposed to change from planning commission to zoning administrator review in order to give more time to the planning commission to devote to larger, more complex projects. Um, these changes also allow the planning commission to continue with its core purposes as laid out in the county code um, to develop and maintain the general plan, uh, develop specific plans as necessary, review the annual planning department work program and budget, and review the capital improvement program. 
Um, the commission uh, is intended to be primarily a, po a policy focused group uh, and the proposed changes to permit reviews would allow the commission to regain that focus on legislative actions such as code and general plan amendments uh, as well as weigh in on more controversial projects that come to the planning commission on appeal um, rather than reviewing less significant individual project applications. Um, in terms of uh, specific project application types that the Planning Commission would continue to review, um, those would include certain agricultural, infrastructure, commercial, and cannabis uses, uh, permanent room housing projects, subdivisions with more than five sites, uh, med certain medical projects, uh, and uh, certain mixed-use commercial and residential projects, uh, as well as senior housing projects. Um, note that in the staff report, um, there is an error in that the agricultural uses and the mixed use projects were not um, included in the list uh, uh, provided in the staff report of the, the project types that the Planning Commission would review. Um, and then regarding um, senior housing and mixed use commercial and residential projects, um, staff did identify an inconsistency between the draft uh, commercial use chart and the site development permit chart. And we do propose uh, an update that would uh, allow for P uh, planning commission review for projects with more than 10 units rather than for projects with more than five units as indicated in the use chart. Um, since per the site development chart, residential projects uh, generally do not require a conditional uh, site development permit unless they include more than 10 units. If the commission is amenable to that change, staff could bring that code amendment uh, to the planning commission on uh, the 14th um, or uh, the commission could make that amendment. Um, as part of the uh, recommendation process. Okay, and then um, wanted to talk about the design guidelines um, as well. So the project includes adoption of new Santa Cruz County design guidelines that provide best practices for building design, site development, and connecting private development to the streetscape. The design guidelines are intended to guide the design of all projects, but especially multifamily residential and commercial development in the urban area. There are also guidelines specifically for the Pleasure Point Commercial Corridor included as an appendix to the document. Um, the proposed guidelines uh, provide overarching guidelines as well as specific design guidelines for multifamily residential, mixed use commercial and workplace flex project types. The design guidelines would be adopted as a separate document but are incorporated by reference um, in uh, chapter 1311 of the proposed uh, code amendments. Um, so since February 2022, the guidelines have been updated to address planning commission comments, um, add clarity and correct errors. Um, and similarly to the code and the general plan, all chain, uh, substantive changes are shown um, with yellow highlight uh, and attached as exhibit H. Um, one key change that we wanted to note was an update throughout the guidelines to clarify which aspects of the guidelines are intended to be enforced as regulations and which are optional guidelines only. At the study session, staff clarified that the guidelines are generally not quantitative and are intended to model best practices. Um, projects that undergo design review are required to substantially conform. Recording stopped. Guidelines. Um, in the updated draft guidelines, staff has further clarified. Hey Daisy, can I interrupt for a quick yeah. second? I'm so sorry. We just, I yeah. just heard that the recording stopped, <laughs> and I want to make sure that we're doing okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I heard that as well. So let's just check in. Is that well, our backup Zoom? I'm going to try to resume it, but we're still recording on the main one. Oh, you are okay. So we can we can continue. Seems like it. Uh, quick question, though. We are running up to 1130. And so natural breaking point anyway. Just wondering um, how much of the presentation we might have left and if we want to try and get through that before we take a break. So, so um, we are currently on slide 17 of 20. Of, uh, of 20. <laughs> okay. Sounds like we're almost there. Would it be all right with everyone if we just finished the presentation before we take a lunch break? Or was that 11.30 pretty uh, hard stop streak? I think um, I'm hoping that's fine. That should be fine. Okay. Great. Apologies. Sorry, that's 17 of 23 slides. 
Maybe well, if we should go ahead and take the break and then come back. But I think we're looking at an extra session any way you cut it. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. If we have yeah that many more, let's let's do that. Then I apologize, Miss Allen. Did you want to finish a thought before we take a break? And since I just interrupted you right in the middle of the sentence. Um. Yeah. Why don't I finish the discussion about the design guidelines since I was almost finished with that, and then we can pick up with the map amendments when we come Great. back from the break. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, okay. So I was noting that in the in the updated draft guidelines, staff has further clarified the relationship between the guidelines and the county regulations by making note of uh, relevant quantitative uh, county code standards and county design criteria that enforce the concepts that are presented in the guidelines. These notes uh, appear throughout the guidelines in orange text, with the explanation provided. Um, in the introduction as well as the beginning of each chapter. Um, and text was also in some cases uh, updated to remove language such as require or ensure and add language uh, such as consider. Um, and then another key change to the guidelines was an update to Appendix B, um, which addresses the development along the Portola Drive corridor in Pleasure Point. So in alignment with the um, Pleasure Point Commercial Corridor Study, and updated general plan policies, language was added to encourage delivery trucks going to businesses on Portola Drive um, to remain on uh, uh, Portola Drive rather than on side streets. Um, language was also updated to clarify that all of the overarching design guidelines uh, do apply within the Pleasure Point Commercial Corridor. Um, staff does note that members of the public have expressed concern about language in Appendix B, page B12, number three, regarding consideration of an easement on Avis Lane. Staff has not made any text uh, change to that uh, portion of the guidelines at this time. Um, and so that concludes uh, our, our comments on the guidelines. And then after the break, uh, Stephanie will pick up with the map amendments. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone for getting us to this point. And we'll go ahead and take a break right now, 30 minutes and be back just after noon, 12.05, let's say, and um, continue from here. And maybe we could have some potential dates for another meeting so we can, so we can be sure when we're gonna meet. Okay, I'll coordinate with Stephanie during the break. Great. Thank thanks, you. Thanks everyone, see you soon. See you at 12.05. This window. I just I want to make sure that the recording has stopped. Yeah, I'm gonna mute you, Renee.
Are we back yet? I'm back. Okay, well, that's two of us anyway. Okay, thanks. I just I always want to make sure everything's working. Thanks. No, thanks. Hey, good afternoon, officially. Um, it's 12.05 and- uh, Recording kinda... in progress. Perfect, recording in progress. And I think I'll just wait to see more people and make sure everyone's here and then do a roll call, please. Um, and then go from there. I heard Judy and Renee during break. I think, think they're here. Yeah, I'm here. All Great. right. We should do a quick roll call. Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, um, Chair, do you want to reconvene the meeting? And Yes, please. Let's uh, reconvene and, and continue with the roll call and then move on uh, or back to the presentation. 
for agenda All item right. number eight. Great. So welcome back, everyone, to the August 24th Planning Commission meeting. I will take a quick roll call. Um, Commissioner Lazenby. <laughs> Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Commissioner Shepard. Here. Thank you. Uh -huh. Commissioner Violante. Here. Commissioner Dan. Here. And Chair Gordon. Here. All right. Great. Thank you. We are all present and accounted for. <clears throat> Ms. Hansen, can we um, please continue with the presentation for agenda item number eight today? Yes, we can. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the map amendments. The um, project includes targeted land use changes and rezoning on 23 parcels located throughout the county. There are two types of land use changes. The first type uh, are amendments to eliminate inconsistencies between the general plan maps and zoning maps on 13 parcels. The county is required by state law to ensure consistency between the general plan maps and the zoning maps. No intensification of land use is, a, is proposed as a result of these corrections. Uh, the slide shows the proposed uh, map changes in North County and South County, a total of five. Um, the second type, let's see, I think, we had a correction, don't we? Oh, nope, that's on the next slide. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, the second type of amendments includes targeted rezones of 10 uh, key opportunity sites along transportation corridors to implement the new residential flex zoning district. Um, as discussed earlier, the, uh, the project also includes um, Sorry, a little glitch in my notes here. We're gonna move on to the next slide, Natisha. Great, thank you. Uh, in Mid County, there are also eight properties that will change to correct uh, zoning and land use inconsistencies. These are shown on the on the map on the left. Um, staff is aware that one of the property owners up on Glen Haven Road has submitted a comment saying they would like their two parcels to be removed from the project. Um, staff has reached out to this property owner. Actually, we've had a few conversations with them um, and they've confirmed that they would like to be, uh, would like to be removed. So um, when we return, you'll see that um, those two parcels come off the list. Can I just ask a really quick question? You didn't understand why is the what's proposed for the general plan different than the zone, proposed zoning? I don't understand that. Um, there are two sets of maps. Um, the there are land use designation maps in the general plan. Um, they tell you uh, what kind of um, land use designation you're going to have on a property. Then there's a zoning map, and the <clears throat> zoning map has um, uh, zone districts. <clears throat> and you might have, in some communities, you have more than one zoning district that's allowed in a general plan um, uh, land use designation, although ours tend to be more one for one. Um, and so both sets of maps need to be updated. And land use designations are termed a little bit differently than zoning districts. Okay. <clears throat> um, the second type of land use amendment is intended to implement uh, the project goal of increased housing options and help to address the housing crisis. Uh, this portion of the project includes rezoning of 10 underutilized parcels, including key opportunity sites along transportation corridors. There's one six acre parcel at Soquel Drive and Thurber Lane, um, which is also shown on the map on the left. Um, this is vacant and would be rezoned to a mix of residential flex and commercial to facilitate a mixed use development. The map on the right shows nine additional parcels uh, located along 
uh, Portola Drive. These would be rezoned to residential flex to facilitate a transition in this neighborhood to a mix of multifamily residential interspersed with neighborhood commercial consistent with the vision for the corridor in the pleasure point vision and guiding principles planning study. Um, the commission has also received some community feedback regarding the surf shop at 3051 Portola Drive. This is shown as um, uh, parcel number one <laughs> on the uh, map on the right. Um, and we'd just like to clarify, just like the other properties that are proposed for residential flex zoning, there's no development proposed at this time. Um, we also note that this property is not designated as a historic resource in the county's inventory, um, but this property, just like every other property that's older than 50 years old, would be evaluated for inclusion on the local inventory if a development is ever proposed. Okay. A little bit about the environmental impact re report um, as required by state law, the county has prepared an environmental impact report or EIR to analyze the impacts of the sustainability update project. The EIR analyzes all topics as required by the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. The draft EIR was released on April 14th and a public comment period was open until May 31st. A community meeting on the draft EIR was also held on May 9th. The final EIR was released on August 12th. The final EIR largely consists of responses to comments and corrections to the EIR text. The EIR for this project is a program EIR, which means that it's higher level, countywide, it's not project specific in its analysis of the environmental impacts. Um, the EIR analyzed all elements required under CEQA and found that there were some significant and unavoidable impacts that could occur in the following resource areas despite the inclusion of mitigation measures. Um, these are largely associated not so much with the adoption of the policies or the general plan itself, but in the growth that could occur under the, under the general plan in the next 20 years. Um, so those significant impacts were in um, agriculture, um, uh, and that is that ancillary uses support services in the essential public facilities and utilities that could be located on um, uh, CA land could result in a conversion of prime farmland, unique farmland or farmland of statewide importance. Um, the mitigation measure uh, proposed for this is to add public and quasi-public facilities to the types of projects that require special findings and requirements to address conversion of agricultural land. In biological resources, um, the project includes the redesignation and rezoning of that six acre site on Thurber Lane. Um, there, this site is a, um, a site that's bisected by a stream um, and it's bisected from north to south. So further development on this site could Im impact that stream, particularly if it's piped or moved. Um, and the preparation, um, <clears throat> and which would be a permanent impact to the riparian habitat on the site. So mitigation measure bio 2 b would require the preparation of a mitigation plan detailing replacement of habitat areas at a two to one replacement ratio, as well as maintenance and monitoring um, for the establishment of uh, plants in the restoration areas. Um, in cultural resources, although it's unknown at this time, there could be future development that could result in a substantial adverse change to undocumented historic built resources. Um, and if preservation or avoidance isn't feasible, then two mitigation measures would address this. Um, one would be the preparation of a historic resources evaluation and measures to avoid impacts. And the second would be um, to require that historical 
um, buildings that are proposed for major alteration or demolition be thoroughly documented according to industry standards, which um, includes written and photographic materials. And transportation um, impacts are measured <clears throat> using vehicle miles traveled, which we've discussed. This is the number of miles generated by, by vehicles, one mile um, uh, traveled by one vehicle is one VMT. In this way, transportation impacts are more closely tied to the reduction of greenhouse gases, um, which is a major state goal um, and also county goal. Um, and the county has adopted VMT thresholds for new development as required by state law. Although the urbanized development pattern policies and programs in the sustainability update will reduce VMT when compared to current conditions and growth under the current general plan, the EIR found that VMT would not be reduced enough to meet the county's adopted threshold in the residential and non-retail categories. Um, also, there would be a cumulative impact when you consider other developments um, and developments in the pipeline. Um, so mitigation measures that are proposed would be um, TRA-1, which would develop a regional mitigation program to create a mechanism for funding um, transit, um, bike and pedestrian projects, and multimodal transportation improvements. Private development would be able to offset their VMT impacts by contributing to these <laughs> projects. And mitigation measure TRA2 would add an additional implementation strategy to the general plan to evaluate additional parking related measures such as paid parking and the use of parking fees. Um, in utilities and service syst uh, systems, the EIR also found that there would be a significant and unavoidable impact to water supply. Future potential development and growth appears to be within the growth projections um, developed by the water districts serving the unincorporated area. However, depending on the timing of development, potential growth in Live Oak and the city of Capitola could approach or exceed the city of Santa Cruz's forecasted housing units in their urban water um, management plan. And Soquel Creek, Water District, um, uh, which includes Soquel and Aptos and La Selva Beach, um, could also approach or exceed that district's forecast. Um, these impacts are therefore conservatively considered potentially significant, and no mitigation measures were identified to offset them. Uh, let's see, during the public comment period, there were 14 comments received on the draft EIR. Can we jump to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and responses to these comments are addressed in the final EIR, which was released on August 12th. Um, the county received comments from local, regional, and state agencies, community organizations, as well as members of the public. Um, these comments and staff responses are summarized in the staff report starting on page 33 of your packet. The comments span a range of topics as indicated in this slide. Responses to the comments include corrections to the EIR text as needed and as shown in chapter three of the final EIR. Um, some comments were acknowledged but did not really address environmental impacts directly. Um, and some of these comments were much more policy oriented. So they're being addressed in some of the changes that we've been discussing today and can, we'll continue to, to discuss. Um, these comments are regarding agricultural impacts associated with utilities and public facilities, coastal priority uses, the memorandum of understanding um, for development west of Watsonville, uh, riparian mitigation banks, which has been added to the general plan, um, special status species with um, which uh, we've uh, corrected with a new appendix to the general plan, as well as EIR changes and some parking um, reduction strategies that also resulted in new um, policy changes. So um, again, we just wanted to take a moment to go over the timeline for the project. 
the uh, draft amendments um, were made available to the public at the end of February and the August um, 2022 uh, hearing drafts were released last week. And project documents will remain available for review and comment throughout the public process until the um, uh, documents are adopted by the Board of, Certifi uh, Board of Supervisors and certified by the Coastal Commission. Uh, today's meeting marks the first Planning Commission uh, public hearing and will return to your board uh, either on September 14th or the date you set when we have discussion. Um, and at that time, we'll be requesting a, a formal recommendation to the Board of Supervisors, as is shown in your packet. Uh, then the uh, Board of Supervisor public hearings are scheduled to be held in late October through probably November and maybe into December if necessary. After that adoption um, by the board, most amendments will need to go to the Coastal Commission for certification. So with that, our recommended actions today are to conduct a public hearing to review the proposed uh, amendments. Um, continue the public hearing um, either to September 14th or a date that you set. So it's a little bit of a change from what we had in the staff report. Um, and as necessary to address um, any final changes to the documents. And then um, under number three, we have the attached resolution, um, which we're recommending that the the Planning Commission adopt in order to recommend the uh, amendments to the board. Um, this would recommend certification of the EIR um, based on findings of fact and statements of overriding considerations, which are attached to the resolution. And then adoption of the proposed amendments, um, at the adoption of the new uh, County of Santa Cruz design guidelines and um, map amendments, and then directing staff to submit the amendments that are coastal implementing and the general plan, which is our local coastal program, um, over to the California Coastal Commission for certification. So um, the final language that, that we would ask for is included in number three. And with that, I think we'll end our presentation and turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you everyone for the presentation. Uh, very thorough and you explained a lot, made it really easy to understand and I really appreciate that. Um, before we go on to commissioner discussion or questions, we talked about opening the public comment. And so I think we could go ahead and move to that op or that uh, part of the, of the hearing right now. Excuse me. Um, so, Ms. Drake, if we could please open public comment for this item. Thank you. Sure. So, if we could please have three um, minutes um, put up on the timer for each speaker, that would be great. I will start with um, Barry Scott. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Well, thank you. My name is Barry Scott, and I live in Aptos, uh, and I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to speak to the plans. The, uh, you know, plans should be aspirational and facts, fact-based, and sometimes the, the facts change. Um, and it's good to be a bit idealistic, uh, and it's essential that as conditions change, planning uh, documents change to meet those uh, changing facts. So, with regard to all of the housing and mobility chapters, and especially to any amendments to the general plan, um, the current draft of the sustainability update recognizes that there is currently no high quality transit in the county. But recently, in June, the county residents overwhelmingly rejected a proposition that would have converted the branch rail line and rail corridor to a trail only, preferring to keep rail transit planning in our general plan. Um, earlier this month, the RTC voted unanimously to proceed with an EIR and preliminary engineering for electric rail transit, uh, as well as continued progress on the coastal rail trail. Unfortunately, most, if not all of the community outreach for the draft in front of you today and comments uh, you have occurred before the, the significant vote and these recent developments. 
The branch rail line is connected to the state rail network and is included in Caltrans state rail plans. Monterey County is building a Salinas to Gilroy passenger rail extension progress, uh, project that will include a station in Paro where our rail line connects to the main line. The rail line provides one of the last best opportunities in the county to develop higher density housing and get cars off Highway 1, thus helping the county meet its access and mobility goals and sustainability goals by planning for that development in areas along the branch rail line to be serviced by electric passenger rail, as well as the wonderful coastal rail trail alongside the tracks. Chapter three on mobility and access does not mention high capacity tr uh, transit, but there's an opportunity to, to include it now. Land use planning supporting transit oriented development needs to occur as our rail system is planned. And that could mean starting the visioning process now of how development will look when rail is implemented. Accordingly, Sustainable planning documents for housing and mobility should include goals for transit-oriented development along the rail line and include zoning changes in order to support our future rail and trail system. These policy issues will need to be addressed and waiting too long would create more burden on future policy makers who will likely be faced with an even more urgent housing and climate issues. Thank you. That concludes my comments. Thank you, Barry. All right. Um, next, we will hear from last four digits, 2915. I think this is Becky, but we will find out. Please state your name for the record. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I first want to point out, I did send an email to um, several of you during the break that you have visibility of slides coming in on a telephone, I do not. And so I ask that you include those slides as an attachment in any future um, planning commission materials on the agenda so that those of us coming in on telephone can follow along and get the same level of information. I want to um, just come right along on the, the draft of Mr. Scott regarding um, the the uh, residential ultra high flex, the RUHF zoning, the new dense development, none of those parcels are near the rail corridor. And to, as Mr. Scott pointed out, we need to really change our thoughts where our dense development goes to dovetail with infrastructure and putting ultra high dense development near along the, the rail corridor will support that and will in fact encourage the use of passenger rail in the future. So I really question why all of this is being uh, put on Portola Drive, which the they're actually recommending to reduce the number of lanes of that currently four lane um, corridor, put the, the dense development near, right along the rail corridor. That really needs to happen. Um, I also, because I don't have uh, the slides, I'm having difficulty following along. I've tried to, to link into the documents and follow as best I can. But what I'm concerned about is um, that some of the agricultural uh, conditional uses are changing. Um, on page 5-25 and 26, ARC 1.1.7, it includes other community or public facility uses allowed. And um, it bothers me to hear that there could be ministerial approval of some of these. Um, that has brought a great amount of controversy to the county in the past. And I, I really want to see more public input rather than more ministerial approval, eliminating public input. Um, regarding ARC 1.1.13 on page 5-27, it talks about that um, the new law, uh, policies will prohibit expansion of water and sewer 
in county controlled areas, your, group, your commission needs to know that the state and Santa Cruz County LAFCO are moving to consolidate um, many of these utilities. Becky, and I hate to interrupt again. Districts. I apologize. I really appreciate your feedback. You know, We're this really well isn't on time. fair. <laughs> this isn't fair. This is so much information and we only get three minutes. But I understand I'll send written comment. My final thing is that none of these documents are available in hard copy at the public libraries other than the guideline document. So please get them to the public libraries so people can review them. And uh, thank you for this time. Thank, thank you, you, Becky. Okay. Um, the next person with their hand raised is um, identified as Janine. Good afternoon, Janine. Will you please state your name for the record? Hi, my name is Janine Roth. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. My name is Janine Roth, and I'm speaking on behalf of um, Santa Cruz Yimby. Uh, Santa Cruz Yimby advocates for abundant and affordable housing in our county. And first of all, thank you to everyone who put an incredible amount of time and effort into developing this sustainability update, including these presentations and the community engagement. Um, we have sent in the comments in written format. I hope you've been able to see them. I'll cover it in a lot less detail uh, today. Um, so firstly, we do want to recognize that this update offers a really significant opportunity to address the housing crisis with uh, zoning and standard changes. Um, but I do want to highlight the urgency to getting going on the work, and it ties back to the earlier conversation about planning for significantly more housing in the next arena cycle. The changes proposed in the sustainability update are estimated to increase the capacity um, by about 4,500 housing units over 20 years. Um, the RENA for the period of 2023 to 2031 are high. The RENA is a minimum of 46, uh, 34 housing units for the county. So it's about the same number as the sustainability update, but less than half the time period. Um, so the rezoning and the standards that the county adopts through the sustainability update allows us to start addressing the housing crisis immediately. The additional rezoning in the housing element is likely to take another three years, um, which is nearly mid-cycle for the RENA cycle. So it, you know that if we don't adequately rezone to accommodate housing needs uh, through the sustainability update, it'll probably be next to impossible for the county to be on track to meet the RENA goals and will be subject to the streamlined approval of SB 35 in 2027. So there's no way that you could permit the thousands of new homes by 2027 if you don't finish zoning for them. So there's some specific feedback on the update for residential, the increases in height and floor area ratio and allowable dwelling units per acre are still inefficient to meet the housing needs, especially along the corridors. The metrics of the floor area ratio and units per acre are becoming less useful in land use planning circles because the metrics based on form-based zoning are more efficient. Um, we appreciate the principle of missing middle housing, but the update limits the FAR of small housing units to the minimum required by the state, SB 438, so we recommend increasing the FAR there. The new workplace flex district should include residential development, including in so-called live-work occupancies. We stress further use of the Dutch intersections. Thank you for the focus on bike parking and further decreased parking to encourage alternative transportation. Finally, the Board of Supervisors approved moving forward with the pro housing designation, and this input is has strong synergy with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Janine. All right. Um, I will now call on Mark Johansson. Um, Good morning, please, or I guess afternoon, please uh, restate your name for the record. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Mark <laughs> Johansson, and I'm a resident of Aptos. Uh, so without repeating uh, some of the prior comments, um, in light of the community rejecting the proposition recently that would have converted the Santa Cruz branch line to a trail only, but instead the community decided to proceed or indicated it wanted to proceed with the county's preferred alternative passenger rail um, along the adjacent, adjacent trail line. So the Santa Cruz branch line is one of the last and best quarters to improve our housing situation and get cars off of Highway 9. But planning for the densities on that quarter needs to start now. 
And that can start with the land use planning, uh, supporting transit oriented development um, in the planning documents that you're reviewing today. Uh, it includes uh, comments in the visioning process, the mobility and access process, uh, and start adding goals for development. The problem you're going to have if the delay in any kind of um, zoning um, um, activities that will be required for the high density along that corridor is it will, if it's not in conjunction with the development of the rail system, um, it's just going to delay um, having a successful uh, system along that line and also delay uh, some of the housing and sustainability issues that county would like to see. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, going back to the list, I'm just going to remind everybody that to provide comment today, you would press star nine on your telephone or um, use the hand icon on the Zoom app. <clears throat> okay, I see a hand raised by Jean Rocklebank. Good afternoon, Jean. Please restate your name for the record. Uh, I see the clock has started, but I've, I haven't started to speak yet. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good morning, Jean. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. And to the commissioners, I uh, definitely want to continue the public hearing at least to September 14th. The fact that only 14 comments were received on the EIR, the draft EIR, should tell commissioners how very overwhelming this entire sustainability update process has been. Um, the planning department staff started, stated uh, uh, regarding trails, uh, I'm here to speak about the environment, by the way. <laughs> At the Planning Commission studying session, there were concerns labeling any open space passive trails as transportation routes. And they said um, it's only the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail and any other future uh, trail design will be managed by the Parks Department and would be subject to a future Parks Master Plan. Um, I'm going to ask, what Parks Master Plan? There is no plan for a Parks Master Plan. Meanwhile, the Parks Department is allowing trails to be built and is very chummy with the Mountain Bikers Association. I don't think this association has credentials for hydrology, erosion, or biological impact, so I'm concerned about that. I'm also very concerned about what was described as future development at Thurber Lane and Soquel Drive property can't be mitigated. We're going to cover up, we're going to destroy another stream and there is no mitigation except that we can, we can uh, possibly do replacement of habitat areas in a two to one replacement ratio. We don't, we're destroying habitat areas. We can't make new habitat areas. Last, regarding sustainability, and resource protection. And here's where I'm really serious. I wonder why the planning department did not review chapter 16.92, the environmental principles and policies to guide county government. Why didn't they look at that and renew 16.92? Not only renew it, but make it part of this. The purposes, of course, of 1692, are to state the determination of the people of Santa Cruz County relative to environmental policies and principles, to direct county government to utilize its powers and resources to endeavor to provide for more efficient use of renewable energy, to protect biological diversity and human health, mm -hmm. protection and restoration of the environment. And so I, I really hope that the, um, well, I think what I'll do since I only have about 15 seconds left is I'm going to take the time and write these comments and send them both to the planning department and the planning commission because I care about the environment and I want to see it protected. Thank you very much. Dean. All right, and I see Oliver has his hand raised. Um, good afternoon, Oliver. Please state your full name for the record. Hi, this is Ishtar Carter speaking on behalf of my husband, Oliver Carter, and myself. We are speaking today in regards to the eclectic and historical culture on Portola Drive. Uh, my husband, Oliver, and I are the owners of Blown Out Wetsuit Repair and Surf Shack, located in the historical landmark at 3055 Portola Drive. 
The 98-year-old building has rich local history. It is the site where Freeline Surf Shop began in 1969. Before that, Hout Surfboards was located here. It is my knowledge that the historic building we currently run our small business out of is being considered for rezoning. I would also like to note that there are three residential units on this parcel with families. None of us were notified that our parcel was up for rezoning. We find this very discouraging. If this rezoning happens and the current properties at 3051 to 3055 are potentially demolished for larger scale apartments and shops, our business and the current long-term renting families will ultimately suffer displacement, financial strain, and unnecessary stress. Blown Out has been an institution in our community for over 25 years. We represent Pleasure Point Surf Culture. We are a highly respected, highly appreciated, and most importantly, a sustainable business serving the Pleasure Point in greater Santa Cruz County communities. And we are asking you to reconsider this rezoning. Last year, we repaired over 600 wetsuits, thus keeping 600 wetsuits out of our county landfills. That is sustainability. We donate hundreds of used suits to those in the community who are less fortunate. We support our local youth with an extensive program that gives every child and every teen in our community a chance to have a wetsuit, regardless of their financial situation. Our business is sustainable, and we support the local community in ways that cannot be expressed in three minutes. The irony that the proposed sustainability plan envisions mom and pop shops and families in the new units. We are your mom and pop shop, and we're representing Pleasure Point Heritage, surf culture, ourselves, and other local families who are at risk with this proposal. We invite you all to come spend a few hours at our shop and see the rich culture and the hub of community that we represent. We are historical culture. Please do not tear down our building or propose rezoning, making it more desirable to tear down and sell. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you all listening to us. Thank you, Ishtar. Okay. All right, going back to the list of attendees, um, this is the time for you to raise your hand. All right, I see Andrew Polini. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Andrew. Please restate your name for the record. Uh, Andrew Paolini. Um, I guess, okay, I'm not sure if this is so, let me know if this is like an appropriate place to make this comment, but this would be in response to about the uh, building at the rezoning at 2055 Portola. Um, just in response, I'm looking at it. I understand that I just like to encourage the planning commission to keep in mind that like, while occasionally some residents, the rezoning does not mean that the current residents will get displaced. I think we have to keep in mind that when people are concerned about like these, you know, supposed historical buildings, a lot of places count as historical is the truth. I mean, I live in a house that could theoretically count as historical. Um, and it shouldn't keep us from building and just and allowing change to happen. Um, and we think about displacement of current residents. We also think about the displacement of people who did live here or want to live here, but could not afford to. I have friends who've had to move out of the state, friends who've had to move out of the county because they could not find housing in the area. Um, so, you know, these people who grew up, these are people, kids who I grew up with, who grew up here in the county, and then they become an adult and they either have to live at home with their parents or they just have to move somewhere else if they want their own place. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that rezoning may sometimes lead to some short-term pain for some people and that, you know, maybe a building gets torn down and replaced with something else that is bigger and allows more shops and more housing. In the long run, it's healthier for the community. And I just wanted to make that comment there that more people are getting displaced by not having enough housing than probably might, than might get displaced by rezoning. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to provide comment at this time? 
Uh, press star nine on your phone if you wish to make a comment and you are calling in. Okay. I'm not seeing any additional hands, Chair. Um, if I see one pop up, might just pause and check in just to make sure. Great, that sounds good. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who called in and is hung around to um, give us your feedback. We really appreciate it and are thankful you're able to make it here today. Um, for now, then we'll go ahead and close the public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Just to do a quick time check so everyone's on the same page, we've got about 13 minutes till Commissioner Violante needs to take off. And then about 20 minutes after that, we got to really figure out what our next date and all that is. So um, maybe we want to start with the next date uh, of the hearing while everyone's here. And then just to make sure we have consensus on that, actually, and then, and then move on to comments. Okay. Ms. Drake, were you able to find any dates? Um, uh, Stephanie and I actually did not have an opportunity to connect during the lunch break, so I'm not sure if Stephanie has any um, perspective dates there that we can um, consider. You, you know, uh, thanks, Jocelyn and <clears throat> Chair Gordon. I, <clears throat> Steph has some flexibility with with this. We'll we'll defer to the Planning Commission's schedule. Okay. Um, particularly if we're talking about a four hour session, you know, in between our two hearings here. Um, uh, one thing I would say is maybe sooner rather than later to keep what we've heard today fresh in our heads so that we don't have to, you know, re repeat information. Um, we can just focus on the commission's comments at that point. Okay, I want to make sure that um, I see that Michael Lamb is with us right now. I want to make sure that we have ample time to notice an additional meeting. So, um, so it looks like he's here. So when we're looking at dates, I just want to check in with him to see if there's adequate time for noticing. So, um, Okay, well, we typically meet on Wednesdays, but we don't need to meet on a Wednesday. We can meet on a, um, a different day of the week, but I wonder if we should see if we can meet on a Wednesday since that's our usual date. Um, I think, Jocelyn, your question of noticing, I think is the first thing that needs to be answered, which is the, what is the soonest we can meet and, and, and meet the obligation of noticing because I don't, want us to have yeah. a discussion around dates and then realize that we are too. Right. So it's oh. going to, so I was going to propose that we ask Mike about um, September 7th. And um, I think that would be probably the soonest if we're looking at a Wednesday, but I wanted to check in with, um, with Mike. Uh, September 7th would not work as the notices would have had to gone out uh, three days ago. I know there is a little bit of a buffer, but if they went out today, we could probably meet the bare minimum deadline. Um, but the notices do take a few hours to, to print, uh, just because okay. there's so many for the, the rezoning properties. Okay. Could, could I ask a question, Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. if, if the commission postpones to a date certain, does that require the 10-day notice? Maybe, Jason? If you continue it to a date certain, um, that would probably work. I was thinking we probably would want to notice it just since we've heard some comments today about ample notification, but that might be okay. We could still do a notice. Maybe it wouldn't meet that same 10 day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's... Jason is on a way in. Yeah, I don't have a clear answer to that at this point. I would suggest that you go ahead and continue it to a date certain uh, that you pick right now and then staff can follow up with that. You, oh. If you want to meet on September seventh, go ahead and meet on September seventh. Go ahead and schedule that, and then, um, and then if if it turns out that we cannot do that for some reason, uh, then we will so advise the commission. Well, if we have it on September seventh, I am planning to propose some changes, and I know I expect other. I'm sure other commissioners are as well. Well, 
Just making sure that if we give you changes on the 7th, you'll be able to incorporate them for the 14th. We would not be able to do that. Well, then we got a problem. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to change the 14th because we are going to be giving you changes. That's our job. Well, but I think that what Stephanie is suggesting, even when, you know, I, for instance, have provided some changes at previous meetings, they've incorporated some, they haven't right. incorporated others. So the ones that they haven't incorporated, so so you can bring up your questions. I think what I was thinking was the extra meeting would be to get questions answered and clarification, but we should all be prepared with any changes we wanna make that we'd have to just be prepared to do that on the 14th. That, that's kind of how I'm seeing how things Okay, so what you're saying back. is we could come up, we could have the meeting on the 7th, ask lots of clarification questions, maybe, and if we want to propose changes, we could propose them, and on the 14th, we, or we could make them in, on the 14th. Hey, I think at this point, we're ready to, if there are proposed changes, it's gonna be through us voting as a commission to make motions, and they're gonna be final. They're gonna be for the recommend, at least that's, that's the impression I'm at is where we're at as a commission, which is like someone's going to make a motion to recommend that amendment, to go to the board, we're gonna vote, and send it onward. And those things are probably gonna happen on the 14th. And we're gonna do it very systematically versus our conversation on the 7th is for us to get any final uh, discussion questions for staff, um, or even if there's anything we wanna have amongst ourselves, but it's more for questions and clarity. That, that's at least where I feel we're at as a commission. Um, and that's what the four hours are for, is for us to kind of like I have questions about some of the changes that were made or I wasn't able to participate in one of the hearings and so I have a couple of follow-ups, but I, I didn't think that we were gonna make staff make changes between those two hearings. That's not where I thought we were anymore. I think that's if we had the opportunity today to respond, there would have been time to make changes. And that was kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, the hope um, for the 14th so that we could come back like kind of clean and then we'd have less amendments, you know, but it um, seems like that might not be possible anymore. Yeah, I should be honest, I don't agree with the documents entirely, and I, I do have amendments to suggest, um, and I, I would hope for clarification and understand the rationale why some things are there, get my questions answered, and then if we're up against the 14th, we'll just have a long meeting, and we can, that's when you would, as, as Commissioner Dan said, bring back uh, changes, but let's see how it goes. I guess the best we can do is the 7th, which is too bad because that, but that gives us all two weeks to get very clear on the parts and questions we have. I've already got a bunch and I know. So it ought to be razor sharp in two weeks. <laughs> Should I, um, Chair, would you like me to just do a quick um, vote to see if folks are available for the seventh? It's, I haven't heard any. Yeah, I have one question. quick question. If we're, before we do that, just if we are gonna do, do uh, postpone this to a date certain and the noticing doesn't in fact matter, could we do it sooner like next week in order to give staff more time to make adjustments? That would certainly be it... my preference. Can we do that? That would be best. The 31st. Um, if we do a date certain to the 31st, continue to a date certain 31st, what we could do is just do any courtesy noticing that we could do, but just not the, the public hearing noticing. I think that. I'm work. sorry, I actually cannot do the 31st. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. Can you do the 7th? I can do the 7th. And I can do, uh, I can do, wait, I'm sorry, I can do the, I can do the second also if we want to have it next week. Um, I could do this. Could, can others do the second? That's a possibility. Yes. I can do it. Yeah. Yes, I can do the second as well. Rachel, okay. I assume the first doesn't work for you. The 31st, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, the, the first. But the first. Um, I, put a little, I have to find, I have to make a call before I could say for sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, let, let's go for the second since we, we can walk away knowing what we're doing. <laughs> Jason, so is, the procedural. Is, yeah, I was just going to ask, a, 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 um, but I don't want to interrupt you. Please 
that's yeah, your question. Yeah, from a procedural standpoint, if it turns out and for noticing reasons we cannot do the second, what does that mean in terms of will we still be able to move it to say the seventh? For noticing yeah, what reasons, was, what problems does that raise for us if we don't set a date certain today? Yeah, what I what I um, I what I'm understanding is is that you have a date certain set for September 14th, and that's already been noticed. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. so uh, as a legislative body you can have a special meeting on 24 hours notice. Um, you can also continue this public hearing um, to a date certain. Um, the question that we don't have answered right now because the staff needs to look into it more deeply is whether or not there's a certain number of days that you have to um, notice to continue the public hearing. I don't believe that there are. Uh, but we need to confirm that. So my suggestion and recommendation would be that you go ahead and select the date that you want to have it. Somebody um, adopts or somebody somebody proposes a motion to um, continue this public hearing to that date certain. And then if we look further into it and find out that we can't do that because of the noticing issues, then um, staff will consult with the chair about um, canceling that meeting that you just scheduled on. Uh, you, that you're planning to schedule on September 1st or 2nd. Well, that, how will we be able to, I guess is my question to that, to then schedule an alternative date between the two? So will we, will we be essentially kind of forfeiting <laughs> our ability to have one say the week of um, the 5th, if, if it turns no. out that the 2nd doesn't work? No, that's what you're doing right now. I mean, you're just you're you're trying to set an interim meeting, and so if it turns out that you can't set an interim meeting, then you wouldn't be able to do it between the second and the fourteenth anyway, because the notice because if if notice is a problem, then notice is a problem. And I'm sorry, we just don't have the answer to that question. But aren't we close? Can we close the public hearing anyway? What was that question? Well, <clears throat> we closed the public hearing. Oh, the public comment portion of the hearing. I don't think we closed the public hearing. Right. So where are we? I'm very confused. I think the second would be fine or the seventh. The second yeah, so would be better for staff. It seems like we can choose a date between now and the 14th. There's a chance that it might not be able to happen due to noticing, but we won't know that right now. So um, <clears throat> then I guess the next question is if we don't, have the opportunity to actually have a meeting between now and the 14th and we need to push another week or something you know Ms. Hansen, is that going to be a huge issue seems like we need the time somewhere so I'd really encourage you to find an interim date if possible so that we can continue to make our board meeting schedule yeah we I, okay I think that's well, our, our goal I Go think ahead. we are desperately trying to do so, but there isn't information available on whether we can do it or not. But I would agree, <clears throat> we can't get till the 14th. We need another meeting whenever it happens. If we're treating it as a continuation, we don't need to re-notice. We've never re-noticed a continuation to a date certain. Um, I was saying we could do a courtesy notice that wouldn't be the public noticing, um, but we have a you know a noticing list that we could send the information out to. Um, but, but Jason, we haven't ever noticed a continuation. I'm not sitting in front of the code right now, but um, there's a code section that speaks to us. So I think we're fine there. We, we will double check, but I think I think we will be fine. It's, and it's sounding to me like the 7th is, is a date that everybody is available at this time. Um, the 2nd is a, is a maybe for, for Commissioner Dan. Um, I mean, I would prefer the seventh, to be honest, um, but I can do either. And I will make the first or the 31st, uh, I can readjust things to make those work as well. So I'll, okay. I'll just be flexible. Okay. So we will follow up right after this meeting um, with the commissioners to confirm, but I think that we're safe in, in moving forward with selecting a date. So um well, the advantage of choosing an earlier date is simply that if we want to make some suggested changes, they could be in, incorporated. So, Rachel, is the, so you're saying of the three early dates? I'll make the 31st work if that's what everybody else would like to do. Yeah. Uh, I think any of 31st, 1st, or 2nd is fine for me. I have a meeting on the 31st. I could look to move, um, but I do. It's smack in the middle 
unless, yeah, I do. I have a complex on the 31st. I could, I could look through, but I do. So what about, Rachel, you said the second is clear for you? I can make the, the first or the second. Allison? The, the first and the second could both work for me. Me too. Yep. Tim? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, you know, I can rearrange it a lot of things and that's what I'd prefer to do. So, um, and probably oh, sooner gosh. rather than later. So my, my, uh, preference would be the first. The, the first. first, I think we're choosing the first. Works for me. The duty may in. Did we hear from Commissioner Lazenby? Is she here? Oh, there she is. For, so you guys are looking at a Thursday, the first. Yes. Rachel, are you sure that works for you? Judy? Yes. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> I think. Yep, Hi. you're back. <laughs> and we are voting. <laughs> We're looking to, oh, to um, move or uh, schedule the next meeting for either Thursday, September 1st or Friday, September 2nd. And just looking for consensus on the best day there. So, did you have a preference, or I have no preference on either one. Okay. I can I can be there either day. Wonderful. Well, let's go. We let's choose a date just to clean it up. Let's go for the first then. Great. Everyone's okay yeah. with that. Yeah, are we meeting right, nine to one or one to, you know, morning or afternoon? Um, I, I should probably, I don't, I, I'm just thinking just quickly about confirming with CTV staff, um, the folks who host our meeting, I will um, text her really quickly. Um, this September 1st, and that works for your team, Stephanie, right? Yes, we can make that work. Okay. Um, all right, I'm texting them. I think we should be able to find someone. Oh, she's asking. <laughs> I have CTV staff checking just to confirm. I see a hand raised by Annie. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Jocelyn. I just wanted to mention, I did look up the code section, which is in 1810-223-E. Uh, which reads notice of continuances, any matter may be continued from time to time. The proposal need not be re-noticed if at the time of the public hearing for the proposal, the matter is continued to a specific date. Otherwise, the continued matter shall be noticed in the same manner as the original hearing. Okay, good. Thank you, Annie. Thanks, sure. Annie. Thank you. Hey. Let me let me let, let me just add though. There's there's additional considerations in addition to what's in our county code um, that arise out of the Brown Act. Um, uh, and the consideration is whether the meeting is being um, continued or adjourned for less than five calendar days. No new agenda need be posted so long as a new item of business is not introduced. So it's making me um, believe that we do need to post um, Jocelyn. Uh, because this is going to be for a continuous that's longer than than five days. Um, so we'll have to consult on that. Okay. Okay, let's consult on that. Okay. Mm. Um, I, <clears throat> as I'm waiting to hear back from CTV staff, I would propose the same meeting time if that works for everyone just we're used to the 930 time. Okay. <laughs> for okay. Me. Um, and if I could make just one more suggestion, if it's possible, I wonder since um, we're kind of reserving these for commissioner comments, if um, we could just start with uh, commissioner questions. And if there's any public comment, then we can hear that. At the end. And staff, any staff presentation um, be kept, like maybe even just if there's, Anything staff wants the commission to know, maybe that can just be sent to us via email. I think that's a good plan. Mm -hmm. That's right. I don't think staff would have a presentation to to add, and we could move right on to 
commissioner comments or public comments as you wish. Okay, does, do I need to make a motion or do we need for the chair or what? Uh, a motion is there, necessary. We, have, we have to make can, a motion to continue the hearing to that date certain. I will make yes. a motion to continue this hearing to a date certain of um, September 1st at 9.30. I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to move the hearing or continue to 9.30 on September 1st. Any discussion before we move to a vote on this item? I think we've discussed it a lot. Great. <laughs> Well, let's do that. Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call vote? Commissioner uh, Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. That passes. And so then with that, we will move on, close um, agenda item number eight for today and continue it on next Thursday. Uh, so we can move on with our next regular schedule agenda items at this time. We have the planning director's report. Do we have a report today? Mr. Machado, hello. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, you know, I've been meaning to give a little um, info on water and I think it's appropriate since we talked a bit about water today and so I want to just give a high view and uh, offer some more detail as we go forward but um, you all probably know a lot of this but I'm going to give you some facts and figures I just need about two minutes so um, as you all know our region relies on surface water groundwater and recycled water uh, there's actually three primary groundwater basins the Santa Margarita the Mid County and the Pajaro uh, there's 15 principal watersheds, uh, the largest being the San Lorenzo River watershed. And interestingly, in 2020, uh, in total, our entire county region used 51,500 acre feet, without half of that being used by our ag industry uh, in the Pajaro Valley. Uh, of all this usage, 19% was surface water, three, uh, sorry, 19% uh, surface water, 78% groundwater, and 3% was uh, recycled water. Uh, notably, though, the city of Santa Cruz, who serves about 100,000 people, they do serve people outside of their jurisdictional boundary. Uh, they rely uh, on surface water for about 95% of their um, of their supply. And uh, each of our urban water suppliers have a urban water management plan, uh, where these plans, in addition to including drought measures. They also project adequate water supply for future growth. Uh, combined, these plans show a population growth of about 40,000 people by the year 2045. Um, current urban water supply uh, today is about 23,000 acre feet per year. We, so we as an urban community or our urban area uses about 23,000 acre feet per year. And the projected use by 2045 for the additional 40,000 people in our urban area is projected to be 26,000 acre feet. So about a 3,000 acre foot per year increase is projected over these next 30, uh, 33 years, uh, 23 years, sorry. And so, and this is where it gets interesting. I wanna put that in perspective of, of other components of water in our region. So I'll first start by comparing it to rainfall. And so our county consists of about 400,000 acres. And even during a drought year, uh, we receive more than 24 inches of water every year. Um, and by the way, our average rainfall uh, in the coastal area is about 36 inches. And in our mountainous areas, we get about 60 inches. Uh, but even in a drought condition, we still get more than 24 inches. So using the 24 inches over the 400,000 acres of land that can, that make up Santa Cruz County, that's 800,000 acre feet of rainfall lands on our county every year. So that's just perspective in terms of how much we use and how much water actually falls in our county. Um, another underutilized water source is actually wastewater. And so the city of Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant, they discharge about 36 acre feet per day out into the ocean. Uh, that equals about 13,000 acre feet per year. Uh, and with minimal uh, additional treatment, that water could be used for irrigation. 
and with further treatment, it could be used as a potable water supply. Uh, in conclusion, there are real opportunities to increase our total water supply by better utilizing our existing resources versus not having enough resources to supply our needs. I just want to point out the, the water resource that we have in our county, it's vast. Um, you know, we're not necessarily using it all today. We're not even managing it all today, but there's definitely opportunity. I share this with you because if you would like more information, more detailed information about water supply in general, uh, we could certainly um, uh, schedule a future presentation for your, for your commission. And that concludes my report today. Thank you. Well, I, I just have to say that that's a really helpful, but those are such a gross overview. I mean, I think to really assess the water, you'd have to talk to the water districts. I mean, just saying, well, we get this much rain and this much, but you know, that doesn't really tell me. I mean, that's helpful and interesting, but doesn't really speak to the issue of, you know, so it's too high I, level. <laughs> I agree with that. And that's why I'm offering a detailed presentation by our uh, water providers. And we do have uh, a group. And so we do have an integrated regional water manager. And so I'd be happy to arrange for a detailed presentation to get into those details. I agree. I'm just, I'm just trying to whet your appetite for a little more water conversation is all I'm trying to do. Um, to, to what end? Do you think the planning commission needs to hear this at this point in time? What, why, what's going on? I think it would be a good future conversation. I, I don't think it's today. I think we have our hands full today but I'm just planting a seed for the future, um, no time certain. I think understanding our water supply is an important um, part of all of our jobs. And so I think there's value in understanding the details and the future potential and the opportunities for, for um, utilization and management of our water resource, which is, I would say, one of our most important resources that we have. And so I'm just planting a seed now for a, a future discussion if the commission would like to. Well, thank you. I think that's helpful, but if we had a future discussion, I'd sure like to hear from the SoCal Water District and the San Lorenzo Water District and the city and Scotts Valley, because they all seem to have different opinions about everything. Thank you, Chair. I, yeah, absolutely. And I just want to add, I find it fascinating, and I would love to have more conversation at some point whenever the time's right and uh, be able to understand those points a little bit better and, you know, um, yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, great. And uh, we are scheduled to talk about any report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. We talked about that quite a bit, but um, I strike to have further uh, discussion on that. Um, well, just quickly, it sounds like we'll be meeting on September 1st, a special meeting. And then we'll be meeting again on September 14th. And those are both meetings to um, continue the discussion on the sustainability update. And then the next meeting after that is September 28th. And so far we have one item on that agenda, which is the um, Seacliff Hotel project. And if I can just interrupt very briefly, uh, Jocelyn, I have confirmed uh, during that colloquy there that we we do need to post an adjournment of the meeting within 24 hours uh, and uh, uh, the continuance, the adjournment and continuance of the of the public hearing uh, to a special meeting on September 1st, which we will have to post. So we have to post both of those things, the continuance of the meeting within 24 hours, and then the special meeting uh, agenda will have to be posted within 24 hours of the uh, September 1st date. Jason, can I ask a clarification question on that? Sure. Does that just need to be posted on the county's website and a paper copy and on our department floor, or what, what's the extent of the posting? It needs to be, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Thanks. A, a, yeah, a copy, a copy of the, of the order or notice of adjournment slash continuance uh, has to be place conspicuously posted on or near the door of the place where the regular adjourned regular special or adjourned special meeting was held within 24 hours after the time of adjournment. So you need to post it. I would do both. I would, I would post it like you do regular um, agenda materials. Okay. okay. Thank you. 
a good lesson in the applicability, practical applications of chapter 1810 and the use conspicuously, which is subjective. Um, yes, I agree. And I'm going to follow up with you, Jason, after the meeting, just to be clear on continuances, but I don't want to take up our time sure. with <laughs> today's meeting. Great. Thank you. We didn't. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, that's, that's it for future upcoming um, agendas, Chair. Great. Um, thank you. We didn't um, finalize maybe direction on this, but are we going to send out courtesy notices for the hearing next week? I think it'd be beneficial if we're able to do so. We have a we have a list um, that we can send out um, an email list, as I recall. So we can send it out to those folks if we want to do a courtesy notice. Um, that maybe that same one that we're going to post, um, we can email out. I'll I'll confirm with Stephanie how she wants to handle that. But I I agree mm -hmm. that if we if it's easy to do that, that would be good customer Great. service. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Perfect. And last uh, item on the agenda, county, county council's report. Anything to report today? No, thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay. That sounds great. With that, then we are through our agenda items and we can go ahead and adjourn the meeting today. And I appreciate everyone's help and, you know, effort getting through this and looking forward to the next one. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. See you, See you on soon. the first. Okay, bye. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.